So today we're going to begin generative models. I'm very, very excited for this. I know I say that every week, but this week I really, really mean it. <laughs> this is the most exciting one until next week. Um, we're going to basically uh, learn about what generative models are. As the name implies, generative models are models that allow you to generate new samples. And uh, we're going to first go over what they are exactly, how they work. Uh, what their foundations are, why we use them, um, talk about some of their applications, and then we're going to do a tutorial uh, like later, in, I think after the break basically, where I'll show you, first we'll, we'll kind of talk about some of the grunt work that's associated with training these, like getting data sets, processing those data sets, and so on. We'll talk about some resources for helping you do that. I've got some scripts that are kind of ready to use, and then I'll show you um, how to train one. We're going to use one of the sort of uh, like a very standard uh, DC GAN repository. I'll talk about what that means in a moment. And I'm going to show you how to train it on paper space. So you're basically going to see everything from, from start to finish. Um, by no means is it going to be the only thing that's relevant to this class, but it'll, it's kind of the best sort of 101. And we'll talk about some of the other repositories as well. As you can see from these images, um, GANs are approaching like hyper reality. I just I gave a talk the last week where I basically framed it as I warn people about the future. Like this is actually something that you have to think about like when you can basically do this. Because well this isn't even this is pretty tame. It's mostly dogs. But of course like um, you can imagine once you can synthesize anything, um, well, that's gonna have far reaching implications and we'll talk about what those are. Um, and this is just actually from a few weeks ago. So a lot of this stuff is is obviously very recent. Um, but we're, we're going to kind of go from the beginning. Um, a couple of announcements I want to make. Uh, just a few. I made some small fixes to ML for AO effects um, that, uh, that were requested. So some, some of you asked about this. So Covnet Predictor uh, can actually scan directories of images now. So you can train them like a directory of Im images that you input into it, which is kind of nice. That's like a badly needed feature that, that I only got around to making yesterday. And then also uh, image TSNE live, as some of you pointed out, there was a little note to self that I left in there to make it save JSON. Um, now that's actually working. Um, so that's just for any of you who want to kind of get back on that stuff, that's, that's available to you. I want to mention really quickly about AI Lab. So this Friday, uh, we don't have anything scheduled right now. We're going to figure out something to do. If anybody's interested in showing something like, or getting feedback or, you know, it's very informal. Um, please let me know because because we have some some uh, yeah some some free room there. Otherwise, like maybe Chris or I will do some tutorial on something like maybe using HPC or something like that. Um, and then next Friday, um, we just arranged this. We're gonna have a, a guest coming in named Helena Sarin, who is uh, an artist who's been using GANs a lot for the last couple of years. Like she's doing really awesome work. I've actually never met her in person, so that should be really fun. And uh, maybe some of you have seen her work. Her name, she's Glagolista on, on Twitter, um, posting, posting lots of stuff like this. Okay, so let's introduce generative models. Uh, first of all, why, so as I, as I mentioned, generative models are um, representational models of data set that are able to synthesize new samples that resemble the data set. Um, now, uh, first of all, why study them? Why are scientists interested in them? They have a lot of really interesting applications. Obviously, you can use them to generate graphics. So think about assets inside of video games or interactive media. You can generate assets on, on the fly. Um, they are uh, responsible for all of the language models that we use for making things like chatbots and, and, you know, and personal assistants and, and these so-called duplexes. I don't know if any of you saw that Google blog post about the duplexes that they train to sort of fool like operators over the phone. Um, so that stuff is all powered by uh, language generative models. Um, there's a lot of really interesting accessibility applications because you can, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week when we get into, into conditional generative models, but you can do things like image to text, text to image, sound to text, um, text to sound. Um, so all of those things can, uh, for, for let's say like situations where one is preferable to the other, um, there's a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of accessibility ap uh, applications that can benefit from that kind of stuff. So, um, so that's another thing you can use with them. 
the probably the sort of most far-reaching is like the idea of using it using uh, generative models inside of reinforcement learning applications so recall that reinforcement learning which we will have a lecture about later in the semester um, reinforcement learning is all about training agents that behave inside of an environment and have an effect uh, uh, have an effect on the environment um, interact with it and so you have these agents and they have to be able to sort of simulate the future right um, you know if you're if you have a, an agent that's playing chess it has to be able to simulate many possible games of chess and kind of you know take them to try to, to try to conclude about them which which ones are are useful for you know planning or reasoning or other kinds of tasks um, generative models are all about explaining and modeling phenomena so like climate models can be um, created using generative models um, and generally speaking anything that we um, anything that we want to understand how it works we want to what, what does it even mean to understand how something works in the real world right like what is physics all about it's all about trying to create an explanatory model which is able to predict the, the past correctly and predict the future correctly and so on um, and so I, we we all like this quote from Richard Feynman what I cannot create I do not understand and that kind of uh, very much captures I think the motivation of scientists to study generative models and of course they have lots of really awesome music and art applications I've been really curious about these for a really really long time I've been really excited by it too because like we you know like 10 years ago the idea of doing this was I actually just thought like we'd never be able to do it it was too like you know generating that many samples at the same time it just seemed like very very computationally infeasible um, not that I knew anything but you know <laughs> but uh, it turns out I was wrong like on my uninformed guess so um, it's pretty interesting that we can do this stuff really well and obviously like we're gonna see um, some of the cool examples of that uh, and, and kind of to follow up on that, like why are, why are generative models interesting to artists or like, you know, let's say like why is it interesting um, to so many artists and like I can maybe just speak for myself. You know, the, the idea is that these, you know, you have a, when you have a large data set that describes the world somehow or images or sounds or text you can use generative models to kind of come up with this conceptual model of what what the high-level characteristics of those things are. I don't know if that's a really good way of putting it. I've always been really interested in this. I've had all these. I've had lots of projects where I've tried to kind of try to tap into the hive mind. You know what I mean? Like the collective mind. Um, and and generative models are maybe a uh, way of doing this. What's going on today? Like <laughs> um, out there. Anyway. Um, yeah, this is, and by the way, this is made using um, Runway. So Chris showed you Runway, and, and this was um, just a sample made by Janelle Shane of a, uh, using attention again inside of Runway. A woman is eating a delicious sandwich, right? And there she is. Isn't that lovely? Well, what are generative models? Um, so in a more formalistic sense, a generative model is a model which, um, which models the probability distribution over all possible, let's say you're dealing with images, it models the probability distribution over all possible images, such that images that look like they came from the data set have a high probability and everything else has a low probability. And generally speaking, they're, they're kind of, they're basically implemented as deep neural networks. That's, that's our F here. And that F is trained on many images of something and then the, the, uh, that function f, that neural network, will take in some small input variable, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what this z actually is, um, but it takes in, let's say, some small input code, we might call it, and produces images which look as though they're, they're uh, that have a high likelihood of having occurred in the original data set, but they're not real, right? So these are all sort of fake faces that look like they came from there. And um, in practice, what that ends up looking like, z is usually this sort of low dimensional vector of what effectively look like random numbers to us. Uh, but they, they do have some, um, it, 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 this, this also gets into like more details that we'll cover more later, but z can be structured in various ways. Um, so it's often, it, it's often just a random number, right? So this is like 
sampled from a unit Gaussian. That's what like DC GAN is. Um, but though, but Z can be uh, trained under certain constraints to have certain kinds of properties that we like. Like for example, um, that Z can indicate certain things about an image. Let's say if you're doing image to text or text to image, Z can be actually a conditioning label. Um, and and it, it will, again, we'll see more what that means. But that's the basic structure of a generative model. And it's also worth kind of, um, I think I have a slide about this, yeah. So um, a, a, a somewhat more mathematical view for, for those of you so inclined is that you are trying to learn, a like you have a model and you're trying to learn a distribution, a probability distribution, which is similar to the distribution of the actual data set. Now, how do you measure uh, uh, like the similarity of data sets? There's various ways of doing that. Um, usually it's something like if you've ever heard of like KL divergence, for example, it's like the, the, difference be the distance between two probability distributions. Um, but in general, there's, there, you can never actually recover that from the true data set. So it's, it's not something that you necessarily um, ever measure directly. Nevertheless, that's the goal, right? So we have this actual true data distribution and the black dots there, those are actual points, right? And so that blue sort of, that blue thing at the, on the right side um, indicates that where the data set is likely, uh, sorry, the, the actual samples are likely. And we're trying to model that, create a, a generative model, which uh, has the same, roughly same probability distribution and it's, and it's um, parameterized by a neural network. Um, did you have a question, Ben? Is this in considering like the, the distribution of a single image, like the samples within a given image? Or no. Or um, the average distribution amongst a data set? The, uh, the uh, whole data set. So these points, they're like Im images. They're right. entire right. images. And then we and, create a model that would sort of have, mimic that probability distribution for right. a given vector. Right. So this is highly simplified because it's two dimensions, right? right. But really, it's it could be it's right. all the right. pixels, yeah. Something, something very large, yeah. And we'll see a little bit more in the next few slides. Um, okay, so what I want to do now is basically try to give you, um, I want to more or less build up our understanding of generative models by starting with a really, really simple one and then complicating it and complicating it and complicating it until we arrive at generative adversarial networks. That's basically the goal. And um, it turns out that there, there's actually, okay, so here's a really simple generative model. Let's say you're trying to model um, a phenomenon of flipping a, a coin, right? So you have heads or tails, right? And let's say you've observed 10 flips and um, you've gotten seven heads and three tails, right? So a simple generative model would be, get, give me a random number between zero and 10. And if that number is less than seven, then predict heads. And if it's above seven, then predict tails. Now, um, uh, that, that's a generative model uh, that predicts like whether you get heads or tails and you can sample from it. Now it happens to be, it happens to capture the wrong distribution, right? We know heads or tails are actually 50%, 50-50. Uh, so maybe we didn't have quite enough data there. Um, this, is a, this is what happens when you overfit, right? So we've overfit to the, to the actual uh, number of samples that we've gotten. And that's our nemesis overfitting. Um, underfitting is also somewhat lesser nemesis. Um, now let's let's scale this up a little bit. Let's suppose we have um, let's suppose we have a data set that looks like this. It's a two-dimensional data set, and we can give it some interpretation. My mouse is invisible. I wish I <laughs> maybe if I go back to it. No, okay, that's fine. So um, on the left there, you have this uh, data set along two variables, and we can give it some interpretation. Suppose we uh, say that those uh, those points are houses and the x-axis indicates the size of the house and the y-axis indicates the price of the house. Now um, right away you should see that you know size of a house and price of a house are correlated right so in other words there's kind of a little bit of redundancy between those two uh, those two points they're not actually independent of each other they're highly correlated um, linearly ind independent in this context means something very specific it means no correlation and um, so in that case, it could be desirable for us to kind of like combine these two, uh, these two measurements into a single measurement that reflects both the size and the price of the house, you know, value or something like that, right? 
Um, now this is the, the motivation of doing uh, what's called eigenvector decomposition or eigenvector analysis, uh, which is closely related to this idea of principal component analysis. Uh, we looked at principal component analysis a few weeks ago and kind of introduced it. The, uh, so I'm going to quickly introduce it again, but now we're going to show something else that it could do, which is really cool, which is that it could be a really basic generative model. Um, principal component analysis is a form of dimensionality reduction. And dimensionality reduction attempts to reduce the amount of information while keeping, most, uh, while keeping most of it intact, essentially to try to get rid of unnecessary or redundant information. And by doing so, we usually are able to compactify the data into a much smaller space, which is much more densely sampled. So let me actually um, show you a quick demo I have of this that I've made um, in processing yesterday, which I'm quite happy with. Um, <laughs> this is, where is it? There we go. Okay, so let's 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 do a little quick demo <coughs> of principal component analysis. Okay, so if I run this, no, yeah. So there's our data set. Now um, you look at it and you go, well, really, there's kind of a line that goes through it. Watch this. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a line that you could fit through it, right? And um, what we could do is we could we could take all those points and we could project them onto the line. Oh, look at that! Spend like half of yesterday making this. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, this is slightly wrong. It shouldn't go vertically. It should go to the point on the, like t tangentially. So I, I made it slightly wrong. I didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because. Uh, because it wants to find the closest point along the line uh, so as to not distort it too much. And so really it will go tangentially. But it's something roughly like this. And then you could do, check this out. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now we've turned that two-dimensional representation into a one-dimensional representation. We turn two numbers into one. But all of the points are still roughly ordered in the same way. Like they still have the same interpoint relationships, roughly, right? The distances between them have been mostly preserved. Um, however, this space, which is one dimensional, has only uh, ha is is very dense. Like e almost every point along this line is very close to one of the original data points, right? Whereas in the original, there's it's just a lot of empty space over here, a lot of empty space over here. And so we know that if we try to sample a point from here, it's probably not realistic, you know, um, a realistic house, let's say. So we can do this in any number of dimensions. So let's scale this up a little bit and look at the 2D demo. Okay. So if we, okay, we have, we have a collection of points in, two, in, uh, in 3D here, right? These are all given by three points. And we see that we can actually fit a plane through them roughly, right? We got this plane through there. And what we could do is we could project all of the points down onto the plane. Just like that, yeah. So, so all these points are now on this 2D plane. And we can actually just rotate this around and make, it, make this whole chart go from 3D to 2D, right? So we went from this you know, 3D to 2D, right? And again, we have gotten rid of a lot of empty space and um, we have now a new representation of the data, which is where all the points are still roughly the same relationships to each other, but it's much denser, right? So like if I pick a random point from here, or if I pick a point that's not there, like if I go right here, it's very likely that this point is sort of realistic, you know, because it's very closely, it's very, close to the others, right? And you could do 3D to 1D if you wanted to, right? Like if these happen to lie along a line, you could find a, a line inside of that 3D space and project everything onto the line. The more dimensions you try to get rid of, the more you corrupt the original data. And what happens is when you try to go backwards, right? Because what we could do is we could always go back from this into 3D space. But if we, um, if we have projected all the points down using principal component analysis, we've lost that original information. Like we've corrupted the data slightly. So it's back in 3D space, but it, they're not exactly where they were. Like the points have been moved slightly. 
um, right? They used to be around there, and now they're like around here. And so what happens is if we, and principal component analysis is it reversible, right? So we find this projection matrix that takes our high dimensional data and projects it down to a low dimensional subspace. And then we can invert it and go the other way. However, since we've already corrupted it, it won't be in the original locations. This is, and this is kind of it's compression, right? This is kind of like the basis of compression. Um, so that's what PCA is, right? You basically don't do it if, if it would cause too much loss in the data. Uh, well, or it um, take a different set. Or maybe not as many dimensions, right? You can, you, you have, there's a trade off between how many right. dimensions you try to cut. Maybe you're looking at the overall loss of the entire model or like the, the amount of error. You could do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, PCA is invertible, right? So there's a projection matrix that you can, that you learn with PCA. It's now it's a linear projection, right? So you're you're actually finding so in a high dimensional space, you're basically finding a okay. Let's say you're in n dimensions. That's your number of that's your dimensionality of your data set, and you want to go down from n to k, and k is some sm much smaller number. Then what you are doing is you're finding a k dimensional hyperplane. Right? Isn't that awesome? Just like, I mean, um, finding a k-dimensional hyperplane and projecting all of the n-dimensional data onto that k-dimensional hyperplane and then pulling out that k-dimensional hyperplane and that's your new representation, right? And um, the way that you go from n to k is using a projection matrix and you can save that projection matrix and it's invertible, matrix multiplication is invertible, and so you could always go backwards, right? But however, however if you go backwards, of course, you've lost some of the original data, right? Um, some of the original sort of, um, well, the fidelity of the data, right? So let's think of this in the context of images. Uh, suppose we're dealing with a three pixel image, which is grayscale, right? So that, that's our image, it's just three pixels. You can think of, the, uh, of all possible three pixel grayscale images as points inside of a 3D space. Like imagine that, that we're in, in this room one dimension of this room represented the first pixel, second dimension represented the second pixel, third dimension represented the third pixel. Then all possible images are points inside of this space, right? And you might have a data set of three pixel images, which is a collection of points in that space, right? Now, uh, there are how many possible three pixel grayscale images? Well, it would be 255 times 255 times 255, right? So that's 16 million, right? So there's 16 million possible three pixel um, sort of colors, right? Uh, gr which are grayscale in this case, right? So that's the idea of in thinking of images as a point inside of a, a, a space. Now images, of course, don't usually have three pixels that are grayscale. They usually have many pixels, right? And so you can actually, um, you can very much extrapolate this to any number of dimensions, right? So suppose you're dealing with an image that I think this is like 13 by 13, then, and it's, and it's color, right? Then you have, um, you have, what, what would it be? You have 30, uh, there's 255 possible um, images, uh, sorry, uh, pixel values for each color, for each pixel, right? So if you're in a 13 dimensional space, then it would be 255 raised to the, three times 13, so 255 to the 39th, right? Which is really, really large number. So uh, to just to give you an example, if your images are 32 by 32 RGB pixels, then the number of possible images you have is roughly two to the 8,000th power. That's an 8,000 digit long number, right? So that's just like astronomical, right? Really, really astronomical. That's just 32 by 32 pixels. The number of possible images you can make from that is, is really, really that big. By the way, um, if people are having trouble conceptualizing things in very high dimensional space, this is the trick. Um, if you're thinking of, let's say, like a 14 dimensional space, just imagine a three dimensional space and say 14. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody does it. As, but, as but, Jeffrey, effect but effectively, you know, we don't really, like, we wouldn't notice all, those, all that space. So, like, like doing principal component analysis and compressing an image is not really like such a big deal because if it's like one, if it's, we don't need to step in one pixel value at a time. Like 
to see. You, you'll you'll see when we talk about how empty space is. That's the that's the idea. By the way, I got that quote from Jeffrey Hinton. Um, really, really nice little quote. So okay, this is related to what's called the curse of dimensionality, and this is really like what makes what made this such a hard problem for so long. So the curse of dimensionality says that the more variables you have, the bigger the space of combinations uh, grows exponentially. I mean, literally exponentially, right? Because if like if you have two variables then you have to multiply them together. The number of combinations of one times the number of combinations of the other. So heads or tails, there's two, there's two possible values, right? So, okay, but the number of grains of sand on Earth, just to give you a sense of the scale, number of grains of sand on Earth is 10 to the 20th. That's a 20 digit long number. Planck time since the Big Bang. So Planck time is like the amount of time it takes light to go a Planck length. So it's really, really, it's like the quanta of time. The number of Planck times since the Big Bang is 10 to the 62nd, roughly. So 62 digit number. Atoms in the universe, 80 digit number. 1024 by 1024 pixel RGB images. That is a 7 million digit long number, right? So it's just like, it's not even like, it's basically a divine number. Like it's just infinity. For our purposes, it's basically infinity. Which means that, that we're dealing with, with very, very large spaces that are, um, that are essentially impossible to to go through randomly, right? So we need something a little bit more, um, a, a little bit nicer. This is a little bit unrelated, <laughs> related, but maybe this is the math geek in me. I really love, I really love this. This is like my favorite sort of implication of what's called the curse of dimensionality. So check this out. Imagine you have a, imagine you have a sphere, like an egg, right? Like you're, an egg's not a sphere, but like okay. Imagine you had a spherical egg. Here's a cool question. Uh, here's a cool question. Let's say you took like the shell of the egg and you asked how much of the volume of that egg is inside the shell. So in, in our three-dimensional space, that shell, it's the, just the outermost part of the shell. So most of the volume is inside the, 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 the yolk, right? The shell has maybe like 2% of the volume, right? Um, so, so, you know, most of it is inside the yolk. But if you go to a hypersphere, Let's say you have a 10-dimensional hypersphere. So that's a, a, analogous to a circle in, in, in 10 dimensions, right? You can ask the same question. How much of the volume is inside of, this, of the shell of that hypersphere? And in 10 dimensions, it's going to be a lot more than, than 2%. It's going to be like 99%, basically. And if you go up to like 100 dimensions, uh, it's going to be basically in almost 100% of the volume of a hyperdimensional sphere in that many dimensions is inside the shell. So that's really, really counterintuitive. And it really just expresses just how big empty space is. Basically, if you're in a 1000 dimensional space, let's say, and you're on the outside of it, like at the extreme, and you go just a little bit more, like the, just you move just a little bit more, you have like, uh, or you expand it just a little bit more, you expand that space its volume by by like many 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 like orders of magnitude um, so almost all of empty spaces on the outside it's, it's just these weird sort of mathy things that I think are really neat um, in any case like um, empty space is a lonely place let's call it so in your analogy <laughs> the shell is what we don't care about and the Stuff on the inside of well, we no, we care. We care about the shell. But it's just it just expresses that like empty space is really vast. But the, and the shell <laughs> is the empty space. Well, the all of it is empty space. Right. But but the point is that like uh, once you're in high dimension right. in a high dimensional space, like um, like the, the the basically no distance calculations work anymore. That's that's maybe the best implication that we can kind of come up with. That now that's okay though because it turns out that most images are noise, right? Like in, if you're in a 32 by 32 dimensional space, most images are garbage, right? Um, the vast majority of possible images that you can sample from, from a 32 by 32 dimensional pixel space are just, gonna be, are just gonna look like these, right? Now here's a little question, like which of these images are most and least alike, right? So like the image, the first image on the left there that looks kind of like a face, um, like, let's look at the first three images. Which two of them are the most similar, would you say? You might be tempted to say the second and third because they're both noise, but the thing is, if you do a distance calculation between all three of them, it's, it's actually going to be like those two are just as distant from each other as they are from the one that looks, looks real. 
Um, most of empty space is just noise, right? And the implication of that is that let's say we have a data set of something like faces, right? So this is a data set called labeled faces in the wild. If you, uh, if you think of these, the, okay, let's say these are 100 by, I think they're 100 by 100 pixels, then um, we can think of these images, this data set, as points inside of a 100 by 100 by 3 um, dimensional space. So that's, that's uh, what is that, 30,000. So that's a 30,000 dimensional space. And all of these images are points inside of a 30,000 dimensional space, right? Uh, why by 3? Uh, because it's color. So it's like 100 by 100 pixels, and it's color, so RGB. So um, in what we might call face space, the implication is that most of the, those images inside of face space are random noise. And the images of faces actually lie, like they in practice really lie along a much, much smaller, uh, much lower dimensional manifold, as it's called, it's like a subspace, inside of that very, very high dimensional space. So the vast majority of this space is just is silence. There's just nothing going on. And most of the faces are actually really close to each other, right? It's like a, a, a manifold. So what happens if we do principal component analysis on this data set, right? So we have a data set and the data set is structured this way. You have a bunch of images and uh, the columns are pixel values, pixel color values. So you could do something like principal component analysis and find a smaller dimensional hyper, uh, hyperplane on which most of the images lie close to, uh, to which most of the images lie very close to and project those images onto that low dimensional uh, hyperplane and use that as a new representation of the data set. So this would be using the actual um, projected, so like the, you have these principal component, your matrix, your, you have a matrix that, would, that could project any image down into this face space, this principal component space, and then you could store each of the projected vectors of each of these images as your new representation of the data set. And you could go backwards, right? Um, now, remember though, if you do this and then you go backwards and you've cut off some amount of the principal components, like, you know, let's say you kept 10% of the of columns or whatever, then the images would not actually be projected back to where they originally were. They'd be slightly corrupted, right? And they're corrupted more and more depending on, on uh, the fewer principal components that you keep. So let's, let's see how that might look. Like suppose we did this PCA, dimensionality reduction, and then we took this president, uh, took this picture of former President George W. Bush. And then what we did was we, we took the image and then we encoded it at, with, with like, let's say we did the PCA for, and kept 2000 components, right? So that's a reduction from 30,000 to 2000. So we encode it and then we decode it back right? And decoding it means reprojecting it back into pixel space. Then the image that we would have would look, you know, roughly, roughly like the original, right? It's, it looks like a little bit, you know, compressed, like a slightly compressed version of the original, right? And that's, that's what it basically is. If let's say we only kept a thousand components, then you see that this is the same thing, but again, like now some of the, sh the sharpness has been lost. 500 dimensions, right? You're starting to see that more and more details are beginning to get lost. 100 dimensions, right? So we've gone from 30,000 to 100. So that's a that's a, a factor of 300, right? So we're keeping 1 300th of the original uh, of the amount of data. And so now we're starting to get like a lot of the details are being lost. And uh, but we're still getting a face, you know, of sorts, right? Because like as the the whole idea with PCA is that the columns are ordered by the by the um, the amount of variance they capture in the original data. So the first column, the one that you don't get rid of, like the, the very first column is the one that captures the most variance, the most range of the data set in the original space. And the second one is the second most amount, and the third one is the third most amount, right? And so as you get rid of the ones from the tail, you get rid of like small details, you know, like color of the eyebrows or maybe the orientation of the face or whatever. And you're left with just like, the essence, 
the sort of essence of faces, right? You so, did this in real time. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, basically. Well, you can't do the analysis in real time, but then once you have the PCA, you could project back and forth. But like if you just wanted to take a webcam image and like, yeah. And you could do it, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy enough. Mm -hmm. um, that'd be pretty neat, actually. So, like eigenfaces in real time. Yeah. That's good. That's a good idea. Um, you might want to do. Well, the thing is, you may want to do it with. Well, this is basically sort of what Mario is doing with Uncanny Mirror. I'll show that to you later. Actually, oh, I'll show that to you next week. I think. Uh, but in any case, like, uh, except not using PCA. But uh, but yeah, you you could do it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So this um, the way these PCA uh, have come about is this has been trained on many faces of. Bush or just many faces in Many general? faces in general, celebrities, okay. yeah. And technically there's nothing being trained. Uh, PCA is just like this or statistical technique. To there's an, sure, there's an, you could say it, there's an opti optimization of the projection matrix. It needs, it need, but it needs the full distribution of the data. You need, you need the data, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess I'm, I'm, maybe I'm a little confused how you can get any data out of the one dimensional hyperplane it's pretty crazy, isn't it? So like we're not just yeah. mapping the thirty thousand data points to a single a, line. a single line. Yeah, insane, right? Yeah, like because the point is that this this projection matrix outward has to be able to take a principal component or some number of them and project outward into an image that is it, it like roughly lies along that. Um, yeah, like uh, roughly lies along the manifold of the original images. Okay. Yeah, so like it's it's like this keeping one principal component is like it has it can only capture like like the most generic possible face like with respect to that data set, right? So it's not like this image is just like the average of all faces. It's the average of all faces in that data set, and so you could see that it's it of course has its biases, right? So, for example, if we projected all of these other faces down, you see that all roads basically lead to George W. Bush. Right? <laughs> like, basically sort of generic looking white face with a suit and tie on. I think there's a lot of politicians in the data you, set. You can't really get any much variation then with this, with this technique. Like, well, I mean, like... To, if you're try, I mean, if you're trying to not use it, what it's meant for, in a way. Because you're wringing out all right. of the details right. in the data set. And you're forcing it like the whole the network's objective, or it's not a network, sorry. The objective of the PCA is to be able to capture as much of the original information as possible. And so, if you're if you're squeezing it out so that it can only get one or two components, then it's going to try to get the most average-looking face within that data set. And as you can see, that data set is you know well it, it yeah. But this is only like that. That's only a recognizable face because all the faces are positioned in sort of roughly the center of the picture, right? Well, all of these point, all of these, like if this is one D on the, on the end, all of those are points along a single line that get projected back out. Yeah, and they and they would lie along a la line. If you projected them back out, they would still be along the line, except in very high dimensional space, pixel space. So that's what happens when you do reconstruction. So that's taking, that's projecting down with PCA, grabbing that code, right? And we call it a code, right? Like it's the, it's the, it's the vector. It's like the, uh, that, it's, it's the position of the, that point inside of PCA space. Does that relate to in, like encoders and autoencoders? And yes. Like yeah. We'll get to those. Yeah. Um, so, so then you can take that code and project it back out into pixel space. And this is what, what those results look like. Now there's a few cool things that you, we can do. Like let's say we take two of the codes in our data set. You know, one is over here and one is over here. And we can draw a line between them. And then we can take a, interpolate through that line, grab each of the interpolated codes, and then project those outward. Right? We could do interpolations basically between these PCA codes and then project each one back into pixel space. And if you do that, you get these gradual changes from one face to another. And what's cool is that if you, if you look at it closely, it seems like the features are kind of very smoothly modulated, right? So like, for example, the one on the, the second row, the hair gradually becomes a hat, right? Uh, the one in the, uh, for, the fourth row 
it goes from looking uh, facing slightly rightward to facing slightly leftward. It's actually like rotating the face gradually, right? So that's what happens that, that you can find vectors along this, this features like, like this PCA space that's capturing these features. And, and it's capturing these sort of meaningful features to us, you know, rotation of the face, right? Or, um, you know, skin tone or hair or hat, right? Or clothing, you know, most of them have suits. <laughs> um, so, so that's pretty interesting. Now, now those, those um, it's, it's a little bit disorganized, right? Because PCA is just trying to, trying to embed these points in a space where, you know, to preserve all the information, but it doesn't have any other constraints. So like the, there's no single element which controls the rotation of the face. Right, that's kind of like maybe a vector within that PCA space. I know I'm getting a little abstract, so I'll kind of just like um, so random PCA codes. Like now you can take just the like you don't have to stick to your data set. You could just take a random code and then take a random code in the space that's not actually observed in your data set, and then use the the outward projection, like the revert revert reversible PCA, to project it back out. And so you get all these fake faces. These are synthetic faces, hallucinated. Right, and they're very blurry. Right, you can see they're very blurry. Um, they're not very good, but they nevertheless look reasonably like faces. Could we okay. consider like these codes vectors? Is that interchangeable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They they are vectors. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How do you draw the line between the two? There are a lot of what we call non Mm-hmm. It's like, imagine that we did a PCA and projected everything from 30,000 dimensions, there's 30,000 pixels, to three dimensions. So we kept PCA of three. So you can imagine that all of our codes are embedded inside of a three-dimensional space like this room. So then drawing a line between two of them is just like drawing a line between, you know, my hands. Right, so here's one code that represents a single face, and here's another code that represents another face, and we just find the line between them. And then we go along that line and grab each m m uh, intermediate point and project it out into pixel space. Yeah, yeah. No? It's like a code gradient. Sorry? Like a code gradient. A code gradient. It's more, uh, more like a distance. It's more like a distance function. But we can record your finding yeah. vectors. Like it's just like two, um, two one-dimensional PCAs, like the PCA we see. Uh huh. And these. So what I understand is draw the line between the PCA codes or um, draw each. Well, the code itself is not a line. It's a point. Yeah, in it's represented by many numbers because we're inside of some number of dimensions. Mm -hmm. So it's really actually just like a point, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is one code, this is another code, and then we're taking each intermediate, and this becomes a face, and that becomes a face, and that becomes a face, so and so on. We compress the it's it's um, the point is a vector itself, right? Because like a point in three D space is a three dimensional vector, right? So each of these are codes, you know. Like, but I'm just drawing them as a point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess my question is, what's the difference between this and doing a pixel by pixel linear interpretation of RGB values? So if you did that, you would just get basically like a fade, you know. Basically, we just go fade from one image to another. But this is not quite a fade, right? It looks like high-level features are modulating in unison. Like, for example, rotation of the face or the background color, right? So, so there's always a face present, even though, um, even though it's, it's moving along that... that uh, Ex that's also true, right? Like, like every point from that space projected outward back into pixel space appears plausibly like a face. So it's so that you know we've gotten rid of all of the original empty space of random noise images like those don't exist anymore in this. 
at higher levels of uh, principal components is what does that end up looking like? Then you have more noise. But maybe more, but but then the uh, images are maybe look more realistic. Right. Like that was that was this, right? Yeah. So like, you know. But, but then uh, then uh, the interpolation would be too might look kind of no, like noisy or not. Like there might be some points. That yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. Noisy. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Like, and we could we could do that experiment. Right. In fact, okay. So if you go to this notebook, you can actually implement this. So eigenfaces that I this is an old technique called eigenface. Basically, it's like a fun sort of computer vision thing. So, and you can you can run through this and give it a shot. Like all of this is in that notebook. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so that was a basic generative model um, of PCA. That's pretty cool, right? Like you can do you can take this linear projection, which can be derived using using pretty off the shelf like statistical methods. PCA has been known for a hundred years, so it's like a pretty old technique. Roughly speaking, I mean, in the context of, of computer science, um, and, uh, and and so and it works, you know, decently as a generative model, but it's kind of ugly, right? I mean, you know, right? Like, I mean, obviously, you get really, really blurry results, right? Using this approach, so it's not a very good generative model in terms of making faces that look good um, or realistic. It's just kind of blurry, and you know, so it's so it's not great. Now, um, why, it, why, so what's, what's the, like, the downside of PCA? So, okay, so like the greatest, the strength of PCA is that it's linear, and the weakness of PCA is that it's linear, right? So really, if you go back, if you look at face space, right, it's very unlikely that it, it, with our faces, or any data set for that matter, lies conveniently along a hyperplane, like a flat structure, a flat subspace. It's really much more likely that it, that the space that the the actual data set is very high, highly irregularly shaped, right? So maybe it's not along a flat hyperplane, but it's along some some curved manifold, right? Curved or otherwise irregularly shaped manifold. And PCA is a linear technique; it's a linear projection, and so it loses most of the fidelity of that of those curvatures. It just you know it slices a line through a curve. Uh, or a plane through a curve, and so it doesn't end up getting a lot of sort of uh, fidelity, right? So the way that we can improve PCA is to use a nonlinear technique, and a nonlinear technique like what? A neural network. <laughs> Who would have thought that we were going to start talking about neural networks? Big surprise. So there is a type of neural network, which is kind of a curiosity. It's called an autoencoder. Uh, how many of you have heard of autoencoders? So you hear them a, a little bit, right? And it, it kind of sounds, so what does auto mean, right? Auto means self, right? So to encode self, self-encode. Um, the idea of an autoencoder, most of the neural networks that we've seen so far, they're kind of like predictive analytical, right? They kind of take a, an image and project it down into a classification or a regression. What an autoencoder does is there's no labels, it's an unsupervised technique. There's no labels. Uh, I mean, there could be labels, but, it, but in principle, you don't need one. And what it does is that it's shaped, let's say, kind of, it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly symmetric, but it is kind of shaped like there's a sort of first half goes down into a small, into a small middle layer, and then the second half kind of goes back up into something large, and then the idea of the autoencoder is that the, the first and the last layer match. So they have the same number of neurons. And the objective function of, the, of this neural network is to have the exact same values on the output and the, uh, as, as on the input. So in other words, like the, the way that an autoencoder is trained is that it's trying to reconstruct I I input uh, in its output. So it wants the input and the output to be identical. That's the objective function of an autoencoder. So um, now, why why would we do this? This seems like this seems um, like as I joke, it's the world's most expensive identity function, right? What's the identity function? It's times one, right? So this is this is a way of doing times one using like a hundred million multi multiplications. So it's pretty useless. Like it's a useless machine, right? Now, w why would we do this? Well, it turns out that if you do this process, if you train an autoencoder so that it reconstructs data 
uh, with high fidelity, and you, and it's shaped kind of in this way, where you know there's some middle layer which is very small. Like let's say in this example, it's just three dimensions. Well, that's that's pretty interesting because what happens is that we're forcing the network to learn a representation of the data such that uh, there such that we're able to reconstruct it even though it has to pass through this bottleneck. So there's a bottleneck layer right in the middle where we only have three numbers representing you know the 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 input. And so we're we're trying to make the network learn a representation such that even though we have this bottleneck it projects out into what looks plausibly like a number. So I, I know this is really kind of weird and, and you'll get used to it the more times you look at it, but um, this is what neural networks are great at, right? Like you give them an objective and they will figure out what, what they have to do in order to meet the criteria that you desire. And the criteria that we desire is that it's able to create images that look like actual numbers, even though at some point there's this bottleneck where those three values there, that's all of the information we have uh, about the input. Um, so what happens is, remember, like, let's, and, and, and by the way, like, this is what the whole famed latent space is. So a latent space, suppose that we trained an autoencoder, or PCA for that matter, right? The codes are sampled from a space, you know, a k-dimensional space, let's say, where every point in it represents an actual image or a sound or whatever when it's projected back out. So this is, the, this is what we mean by a latent space. It's like the space of all possible generated outputs. Um, so, so something like that. And you'll see me make reference to it uh, a lot. So let's very quickly backpropagate our, our mental models of, of, uh, of neural networks to try to understand, like, like remember why, um, why they should work the way they do, right? So recall that neural networks are these, I really love this sort of repetition. You know, every time you look at it again, the same slides over and over, you like, it's kind of distills it more and more. Um, at least that's how it did for me. Um, so you, okay, so these, uh, n these are neural networks that are, uh, ne neural networks learn a representation of images such that when we go through the layers, it forms a higher and higher level of representation of the images. Um, and uh, so yeah, something like that, right? Take an input. We've all seen this, right? So when you train a one-layer neural network, the representation it learns, which is encoded in its weights, means that these outputs, these these outputs right here, are sort of capturing these high-level features. And in this case, since it's one layer, it's capturing the actual image class. Um, if it were two layers, it would capture slightly more abstract features, and then combine those in the second layer to capture more high-level features, like the image classifications themselves. Um, so this is all kind of review, right? Now recall that like when you, you can do these experiments where you, uh, you, let's say you are interested in what a particular neuron um, in the neural network is searching for. And what we saw was that, and you can do these experiments where you try to maximally activate that neuron, you try to excite that neuron with some image. And we saw that uh, all of these neurons, they're, they, they're looking for different kinds of features. And those features are very high level, right? So like as we get to the third or fourth layer of the network, it's, uh, well, now my mouse is there. Look at that. Um, and so this right here, right, this neuron is looking for these sort of lattices and this neuron is looking for text and this neuron is looking for upper bodies and so on, right? So it's forming this high level representation of the original images. And um, we can use it as a feature extractor, right? Because, because as we go from the input layer to a few layers down, downstream, we're getting a high level, a compact but high level sort of, um, yeah, like a compact but high level representation, which is much better for doing uh, a lot of things like calculating the similarity between two images, right? So for example, when, if we use the, these feature extractors, like we convert a many pixel image into a 10 dimensional feature vector, then we can do distance calculations between them and determine how similar they are. So if you do it right, then you should see that the cat and dog, their activations are closer to each other, like the distance between them is closer to each other than between the cat and the truck, right? Um, and um, so now when we do transfer learning, right, 
we uh, we see this we see this manifest right like these uh, these high dimensional feature vectors that represent this sort of content of the image um, are 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 representations you can't do distance calculations between them um, directly sometimes because they're too redundant but you can use PCA or something to reduce it down to a small representation right so this is kind of review from week three I think and then and so then we can take all these images and we can embed them right in this feature space right so all of these you can think of as points inside of a feature space and we talked about embeddings like a graduate a, a little bit right we talked about how you know points that are near each other in the embedding are should be similar and then also vectors between points might capture some sort of a like uh, interesting information right so like uh, with word vectors, there might be a sort of like a gendering vector or a state capital vector or a part of speech vector, right? With images, um, you'll see this in DC again when I show that in, in a second, but with images, you might get feature changes as well. So there might be a smile vector, you know, and, that, and actually that's a, actually a reference to their project that I'm going to show you in a, in a second. Um, so we can think of these images as embedded in a feature space or a latent space, so to speak, right? Images of dogs should be close to each other, slightly farther away from the cat image. The house and the car are even farther away, right? And so this is kind of what we mean by a latent space. It's like the the actual space itself is the codes, but um, but each point represents an image, um, and uh, the images are kind of like modulating their high high level features along along these vectors. So back to autoencoders. So I, I know that a very quick, quick review of neural networks. Now, if you train an autoencoder, then that middle layer is, should be a sort of high level embedding of the original input images. And each of the dimensions uh, should be capturing some very salient high level information about it. Um, and the network learns that representation because it has to. It's being forced to learn as high level of a representation as it can in order to be able to reconstruct the images, right? And that's kind of what you do, right? Like, let's say, like, okay, if you, when you, I don't want to use faces because that, <laughs> like, okay, when you think of a cat, right, what do you really see, right? Like, like, like imagine you're, you're, you imagine your cat at home. Let's say you own a cat. Um, you, you, you don't re recall every follicle of hair that it has in your imagination, right? You kind of like, you have a mental model of what it looks like. And that mental model might include high level characteristics, like what color its fur is, um, maybe how fluffy it is or something like that. I mean, you can, you know, you get the idea, right? Like you, you sort of are forming a representation because it's easier for you to process that. And then it's easier for you to imagine it. Right, so your representation is sort of this low dimensional vector of fur color, face shape, you know, eye color, and so on, that you can project outward because you also have a mental model that can take, like, okay, if I told, oh, here's a better idea. If I told you, imagine a black cat, which has, which is very fluffy and has a bushy tail and, um, and green eyes or something, or cats can't have green eyes, um, whatever. Like the point is that you are, you, you uh, can imagine that, right? Because you have a mental model that takes these small number of characteristics and, pr and projects it into a, an image of a cat. And you know that because you've been trained on many, many cats. Like you've seen many, many cats. And some have seen more cats than others, but the point is that like you can, you can make a mental model of it. So another view of, the, of an autoencoder is that um, you know the first half of the encoder and the first half is the encoder and the second half is the decoder so this is actually one neural network uh, oops this is one neural network and um but but we can kind of split it into two halves one is an encoder and one is a decoder the encoder once it's trained right the encoder takes images let's say of faces and converts them into low dimensional uh, latent vectors or latent codes or input or codes or whatever, right? And each of those, the elements in those codes refers to the presence of these high level features. And then what the decoder does is it takes a latent input, 
uh, latent vector as its input, you know, you can you can kind of imagine splitting the network into two, right? Functionally, the, it kind of is. And the decoder takes these input vectors and projects them outward into the original pixel space. So, um, so what auto now in in practice, what happens with autoencoders, or at least originally it did, was that autoencoders learned to reconstruct these images of faces, right, from low dimensional input codes. But they, they're also, like PCA, they're kind of blurry. The, the quality is better than PCA, but you can see that the outputs at, down at the bottom are sort of like blurry reconstructions of the original inputs. And that was a common feature of, of autoencoders, that they would sort of produce blurry outputs. And the reason is because like, um, you know, it's, it's sort of pixel, um, it's being graded by fidelity of pixel by pixel. But you know, like images can be slightly shifted pixel by pixel, so it's sort of like hedging, hedging its bet, like where the, where the actual face occurs. And so that's why it's kind of blurry in practice. Um, and also in practice, like usually what we use are variational autoencoders, where the latent space actually has a constraint added to it, which is that it's, um, the latent space is actually sampled from a unit Gaussian. So like if you know what a Gaussian probability distribution is, a normal distribution, standard normal distribution, um, so a uh, unit like a, in practice we use variational autoencoders where that z is actually like structured to be a, a unit Gaussian like a, a standard normal distribution in whatever number of dimensions that the latent space has. Um, sorry, sorry what, yeah. what is z in this case? Z in this case is the latent is the latent space, you know, and it's and it's uh, in the variation what's called a variational autoencoder. Um, it's it tends to we think of it as like a. a Normal distribution, standard normal distribution. When you say latent space, though, you mean like all of the points, like all of the space. All of the possible in, points inside yeah. of that. Uh, right. Because like this, I wish I had the mouse here. It's like, <laughs> yeah. um, the middle layer there with the three neurons, right. right? Every single image that you can make with the decoder starts as a point in this three-dimensional space. And so the latent space is the, is the space of all possible images that can be made with this decoder. But, but you said they, for variational autoencoders, they will, um, the, en the encoder part, the first part, will try to put all of the images into the normal distribution in that? Yeah, s sort of, yeah. The, uh, we don't want to get hung up in the details. Like, like for, for the most part, like, um, yeah. That it, there's a there's a we we like for things to the latent space to be structured sort of like um, with uh, in such a way that it's it's easy to interpret it as a probability distribution something like that. Now um, one by the way useful application like like autoencoders can actually have useful applications besides for generative models they can be used for example to denoise data so like noise by definition is like non-signal. Non and so if you do, if you use an autoencoder, you can train, uh, you can train basic, you can take, um, like uh, you can train an autoencoder to go from noisy images to their, to the sort of like uh, normal ones, like without noise, like the speckles, let's say, like if you have speckled images, um, you can actually try to remove them. Um, and I, I bet you like a, in a lot of DSLR cameras, like or software cameras, I think they're probably using something like this for, for denoising. Um, that's just a hunch. But like that's one of the useful applications of, of autoencoders, just as an aside. We're not gonna do that, but but you know, it's kind of interesting. That was a bit crazy. Like, can you show us can you show us that? What did I show you? Denoising uh, compressed audio or something like that. I don't think I showed you that, maybe but but there is like there is like a lot of commercial software that deal that denoises audio it, and it's plausible that they're using something like that, yeah. Oh, for sure, yeah. Oh, no, no doubt, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Photoshop of the future. Yeah. Um, let me let me skip that. Like, I'll show you some cool things that have been made with autoencoders. Um, this guy, Tom White, who's a professor at, uh, in, uh, uni I forget, Queen Victoria University in New Zealand. He worked a lot with variational autoencoders. He made these stick figures. So he got a data set of stick figures and then, and then like, uh, learned... So again, like it's a it's a generative model. Once you've trained it, you can just throw in random Z codes, 
and generate new new images, right? So he threw in random codes and generated like random stick figures, right? And you know it's a little blurry, but it's like stick figures. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, another thing, like this is something I did with a, I trained an autoencoder, this is a few years ago, uh, I don't know, a few years ago, Slebe autoencoder. So this is like, uh, and it's labeled, so this is, so you can get, you can ascertain a lot of information about the, the sort of distribution of the data or how it's labeled. So like, and I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make any comment on it, you can, <laughs> you can, uh, well you see how it is, right? It's, a, it's an interesting and analytical tool, isn't it? Um, to get to tell us a little bit about what the data set is structured like. So it's right. using an autoencoder with a labeled data set. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that's something I didn't mention. Like you could actually include labels, like as a sort. It's almost like appended to the input, and then, then it learns like a conditional distribution. Because we're not classifying in this case. Because right. We're exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Then, and the constraints on the encoder are just is it just like the distribution of the of that latent space that would mostly be constraint posed on the... On oh, the, so, oh, sorry, is, is the constraint what? When, what? You're, when you're generating these these autoencoders, like, because um, we're not doing backprop in the way that you would do in a normal uh, convolutional network. So I don't know what it's optimizing for or what the constraints impose upon the network when you're trying to like, capture the data and view. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, what constraints it has, the constraints it has is like the shape of the network is, you know, it's of course like the, there's a bottleneck layer in the middle. It's all about that bottleneck and how you're telling it to create that bottleneck. Mainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then does it check against itself? Does it do something similar to back prop in the end? Um, does it do, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. All neural networks are trained with back prop. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to quickly, I had something I wanted to mention about this, but I forgot. Uh, it'll come to me later. So yeah, um, random codes being generated into stick figures. Um, Tom White uh, made this thing called Smile Vector. Okay, so like once you, again, like you can, so a few cool things about this, right? So you have this autoencoder, like let's say you've trained it on faces. Then um, one nice thing about autoencoders, this is not true of GANs, for example, is that you can encode images and get their latent representation. So like, for example, if you trained it on a bunch of faces, you could then take your face and run it through this model and grab the latent code and then that, that latent code can make a synthetic face, which is in, in principle supposed to, well, should look like you. Um, doesn't quite do that under normal, like we'll see like better versions of that, that that do do that, but that's in principle what happens. And so for example, like, uh, he he took it. He took my what was at the time my my uh, Twitter profile image. That's right there in the middle. And so he he trained an autoencoder on a lot of faces, and then he took my picture, and then he ran it through the autoencoder and took its latent input, and then projected it outward. And so this is this is like like v like my face projected through this VAE. Right, so that's actually that's the that's virtual me, like you might say. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this is all of the codes being interpolated between like different codes. And so like, that's me being like gradually changed into, um, yeah. <laughs> Just by getting, like, knowing what the vector is between, or like having two vectors and going between them or. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the smile vector being like, I can know what the, if I did have one face and then one face smiling, what that vector is and take that similar. So what, what you can, so th this thing in the left, the smile vector. So basically, you can, through a lot of trial and error, figure out what the smile vector is. Now, there might not just be one smile vector, but but like there might be a vector in which you take any image of a like a non of a non smiling face, and if you add that vector that latent, that vector to the latent code, and then project it outward, you can make it smile, basically. So then he made this Twitter account called Smile Vector, which just takes image like random images. And like makes them makes them either smile or, or go from smiling to not smiling. Yeah. Oops. It just does this all the time. <coughs> Thank you. So yeah, that's smile vector. Okay. Um, it's 1.30, so let me, let me do this. I want to, 
Uh, let's see here. Let me just see what my, the rest of my slides. Okay, actually, let's let's just go ahead and take a break, and then we'll we'll get to Gans uh, at the end. I'm making I'm very slow today, so I think I think we might have to like maybe make some hard because I want to get to the tutorial and stuff. Um, I, I at the end I could always like append that if we if we run out of time, but but um, yeah, let's take a quick break and let's be back in five ten minutes, and we'll start on Gans. Okay, so we just covered PCA and autoencoders. The next thing is generative adversarial networks, GANs. How many of you have heard of GANs? Everybody, basically. Um, they, these are the things that you hear a lot, a lot about in the news. Of course, they have like a really sort of interesting sounding title, to say the least. Uh, but they're also responsible for a lot of the excitement that's been generated about generative models because they've been kind of responsible for making some of the most impressive ones, and we're going to see a, a few of them coming up. Um, now, here's the here's the thing I have to warn everybody. Like, it, it, GANs are really strange, and you know, like everything that I've already talked about so far is hard enough to really wrap your head around without repeated sort of repeated backpropagation through it. But with GANs, things are like a whole nother level because first of all, we no one thought of these until 2014. Like, it's a really really like uh, eccentric idea, and no one had really thought about it as far as I know. Um, until Ian Goodfellow came up with it in 2014 and since then they've just been sort of like the biggest thing since sliced bread as they say. GANs are, um, they're, very, they're very similar to autoencoders in some ways but they're, they're kind of structured a, a little bit differently. Um, the pros of uh, GANs is that they look really awesome. They look great and they have some new applications that you can't really do with autoencoders. <laughs> However, they have some weaknesses as well. They are very unstable for training, so like they tend to be like um, a little bit difficult to train, and they also are sort of there's no easy way. This is more like what math mathematicians would complain about. There's no easy way to to evaluate them or to do like probabilistic inference on them, and that's kind of like the most controversial aspect of it. And also, unlike GANs, you you can't actually encode images. So like that thing that you um, that I, not directly anyway, that thing that I showed you, for example, like, like Tom White encoding my face into the virtual gene, you can't really do that anymore. Like there, there are ways of doing it, um, but they're sort of like, um, uh, they're not, well, okay, we, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. They, they don't exactly work the same way as VAEs. In any case, here's how GANs work. And this is, this is kind of, this is the strangest thing, right? So basically... Like if you compare it to uh, autoencoders, we um, an autoencoder has this nice sort of like top-down format, where you have a neural network that's divided into two halves, and the image goes in on the input uh, side and then comes out on the output side. So it's a relatively straightforward kind of thing. In GANs, what you have is you you sort of decouple this process into two neural networks. One is called the discriminator, and one is called the generator. Now the generator is effectively the same as what a decoder is inside of an autoencoder. It's basically like the second half of the, neuro, of the neural network which encodes images. Oh, sorry, encodes latent codes into actual images. Um, and uh, so the, the generator is effectively what the decoder is in the, in the VAE. But now instead, like the, this like, um, well, the latent code there at the top is is like it, it's not coming out of anything. It's basically an orphan. It's just like random numbers go into a generator and produce an image, right? Um, the new thing is this new neural network called a discriminator, and the idea of the discriminator is that it's responsible for taking inside of an image, and it, it's a it's a standard discriminatory neural network. It's a classifier. It takes in an input image and decides and classifies whether it's real or fake. Real means that it came from the original data, and fake means that it came from the generator. So the generator is trained in order to try to fool the discriminator. It's trying to create images which make the discriminator think that it, they're real. And the discriminator is trained to try to tell, is try, try to, uh, tell whether the images are real or fake. Okay? Um, so it's trying to tell apart the real from the fake, right? That's kind of the job of the discriminator. Now, um, what did I want to say about these? Um, 
So they're, they're, they're basically, they're kind of locked in this adversarial process. That's why they're called adversarial. They're being trained against each other. And they're being trained simultaneously. And what happens is that in the beginning, they are both really terrible, right? Like the generator is going to produce images that just look like random noise. And the discriminator has no idea what's going on either. It's basically taking guesses. But if you train them at the same time and you backprop through them, um, you get... They, both of them become better and better and better um, gradually, right? Um, so, yeah. They, they both become better and better gradually until the generator is making extremely good images, right? Extremely, like, uh, realistic looking images. The, the discriminator is also training at the same time. They're both being trained at the same time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, now, the first paper to kind of use these inside of a, uh, to, to try to generate images were these deep convolutional generative adversarial networks, DC GAN, that was uh, written first about by Alec Radford, Luke Metz, and Summit Chintala. Um, and uh, what they demonstrated was that these were able to make faces that were extremely compelling. Like these are very crisp, very natural looking, very realistic. They're not blurry, right? That's the kind of big difference between these DC GAN samples and the ones coming from the autoencoder. They're not blurry. And uh, they show that, the, that they learn this feature space, which is very, very naturalistic. Like, for example, if you find the latent code, which is able to synthesize images of a smiling woman, and then you subtract images of neutral woman, right? And then you add vector that's a neutral woman means non-smiling woman. Right. <laughs> and then add the vector for neutral man, you get smiling woman minus neutral woman plus neutral man equals smiling man, right? Because the woman cancels out and then you just and neutral cancels out, you just get smiling woman, smiling man. <laughs> right? So uh, that's really neat, right? You can do like arithmetic on the generative space. Here's another one. Man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses, right? So this kind of stuff was like really, really uh, tickled everybody when we first saw it in 2015. These were still just like 32 samples, uh, but you can see that these were huge, huge improvements on the on the state of the art uh, from autoencoders, really making like semi-realistic looking faces that are crisp and sharp and everything. Um, they also generated bedrooms, so they 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 trained this on the data set of bedrooms, and these are fake be bedrooms, 32 by 32 pixel. And you see that it's, it's a little bit impressionistic. It's like you see sort of bedroomish fragments that are kind of scattered. Like if you look at it long enough, you see that like something's off. But if you kind of look at it quickly, like you could be fooled into thinking that's a real bedroom. Right? Um, they put this video on YouTube, like just showing these faces being interpolated. And again, like when all of us saw this, it was like really, really neat. Like we, we hadn't really seen something like this before. So this made a lot of headway in 2015, late 2015. Um, Alec also uh, trained it on a data set he had of album covers. So the thing on the right is a whole bunch of like DC GAN generated album re record labels, um, which is pretty neat. And then the thing in the bottom left I made just using MNIST. And the nice thing to know about DC GAN is that it, it, you, it's an unsupervised technique, but it can also be given labels. You can condition the uh, generator on labels so that you can not just do interpolations through the generative to the, through the latent space, but you can also do interpolations through the labels themselves. So you can do like, okay, I'm generating a sample of a zero. I'm generating a sample of a one. I can also generate a sample of halfway between zero and one. So like a glyph that looks kind of like a zero or kind of like a one or a glyph that looks kind of like a two or kind of like a three. And because the generator is constrained to make realistic looking numbers, it has to find this sort of like smooth path through generative space where every intermediate character looks a bit like a number, right? So that's really cool, right? That's why you're seeing these very smooth um, kind of interpolations. Um, so so that, that was the sort of, that's the essence of DC again. What, that's what that's why the numbers aren't sort of fading in and out. That's exactly, yeah. They're just like morphing into each other. Right? So we're still encoding in this case. When we generate our outputs, like 
the generator uh, the generator outputs a, a, an image. Uh, it, in, it it takes in this its input a code. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, very shortly after DC GAN came out, I was super like into it. I had never seen this before. Again, like I said, like no one had ever told me that you'd be able to to generate realistic looking images uh, in this way. And so I got pretty excited about it. And so I started trying to apply it to things. I ran an MNIST. I found this data set of handwritten Chinese characters being collected by a university, which is, despite being called Harbin University, I think it's actually in Beijing. Uh, I'm not sure about that. In any case, like they were using it, they have this data set of handwritten, like uh, that, were, that were basically handwritten simplified Chinese characters that were compiled by test subjects in, in China. And, um, you know, like most of these data sets exist basically for the purposes of, of optical character recognition. So classification of, of images into the actual characters. Um, so the, um, so the, the, these are actual samples. Um, can you open that? <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's like the crinkles, yeah. Anyway, um, I'm very easily distracted as you can see. Uh, it's okay. Um, uh, it's better than a siren. In the, so this data set, these are actual samples, right? And um, and basically, I uh, I trained DC again on them, right? And these are really sh small, low resolution images, but you can see that that the um, that the DC again is ab able to model these characters like reasonably effectively. So these pairs, the image on the right is the actual character, and the one on the uh, sorry, the one on the left is the actual character, and the one on the right is generated by the by the DC again. So you can see, like with simple characters, it's almost indistinguishable which of them is um, which of them is real, which of them is fake, right? With more complicated characters, it starts to fall apart slightly. Like you can see that one at the top there is like really bad, um, but still relatively plausible. And uh, using this, you can then do these interpolations through Z, right? So through the latent space. So here, these are different characters because it was conditioned on the actual character uh, on the actual characters. And so as you try, sort of change, you modulate Z gradually and you get different versions of the same character and you can do loops through Z. Like you can actually do like do a circle or something like that. And so you get these all these different sort of like, um, you know, versions of the same characters. Um, and then like with the numbers, you can do interpolations between characters, right? So here, like, okay, look at the one in the middle. You have... It's going from the character between people and the character for culture. I know it doesn't translate like like one to one exactly in English, but but those are very rough translations. You could say that like the way that my in my sort of harebrained interpretation of my own project, I often thought of this as like okay, like like I said, like a latent space is the is the is the space of all the possible images that can be generated, right? And so you can generate all these real characters and also fake characters. You can basically generate Chinese characters or Chinese looking characters, right? And the way I always thought of this is that like, you can almost think of like our, like our conceptual, our, our understanding of language is that there's this space of all of the possible concepts that we can understand. And then words are just points in that space. So we have words for some concepts, but there are concepts that we don't have words for by accident of history, or we don't have characters for, right? And so this is encoding the entire space of possible words and concepts and then doing interpolation. So like, okay, the character halfway between people and culture represents a concept that is roughly halfway between people and culture, right? That's my hand wavy explanation for, for, this, for this interpretation. This project, I called it a book from the sky. It's named after the artwork by Xu Bing. Maybe some of you are familiar with, I think it's here in New York somewhere. Um, where basically Xu Bing is this Chinese artist who fabricated like thousands of fake characters like he made up his own Chinese characters um, so I like to think of this as kind of the opposite so he made real versions of fake characters and I'm making fake versions of real characters so uh, that's a yeah uh, um, I'm having a little trouble understanding how you are able to find for instance, child or people or culture within the latent space, because because it's can you can condition uh, the uh, DC GAN can be trained with a label. Okay. So basically, you you train it to 
uh, like to generate samples based on the label that you give it. And so the label might correspond to the actual characters. Okay, so the latent space would be include 5,000 labels of mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then many more er or you would interpolate between the values of those labels? You, uh, you can interpolate between the values of the labels, yeah. And the label is itself a vector. It's a one-hot vector. Um, so what that means is that like, let's say you have 10, let's say you're doing digits, then you have 10 numbers, then a three is zero, 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 one, zero, 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 so on. Uh, a one is zero, one, zero, 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 right? Yeah. And so like the halfway between is just the, the halfway between those two vectors and they're, they're one hot vectors. So, uh, oh, another cool thing for those of you who can, uh, who, who can read Chinese you, or know about Chinese, you know that like um, Chinese characters all have a, uh, what's called a radical. So there's 214 radicals, I believe, which are all sort of the root characters that correspond to like the meaning of the, of the word. And, and like the root character has kind of been lost over the centuries. It doesn't necessarily like, doesn't necessarily have a very easy to interpret meaning. But for example, there's a person radical, which is easy enough to understand. So like things that have to do with people often have, are often based off of the person radical. And what was really cool about some of these interpolations is that the, the, uh, in, in, the, the radicals can actually change shape between different characters and that's just because like the way that people have been writing has evolved for for a really long time and so like the so like the radicals have deformed and so on over time but basically they um uh it's it's amazing how things develop like it's 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 kind of unique in its own way but anyway i don't want to get stuck on this this project the point is that the radicals like are preserved through the interpolations sometimes um, these are cherry picked examples. It doesn't always happen. It doesn't always work. But but in these cases, like the radical is is actually I highlighted in red because it's it's preserved through the interpolation. Anyway, um, that's a book from this guy. Now other people use DC Gans on flowers and manga characters, um, lots of other things. Your cohort here, Sam Haynes, took took one of my workshops uh, last uh, last year, and he made this project called Zero Likes. How many of you have seen this project? Okay, lots of you. So yeah, Sam basically trained a DC GAN uh, and, and also like in combination with an up, up sampling thing. And he trained it on a data set that he scraped from, from Instagram of images which have no likes. So that's, that was the, he downloaded all these Instagram images that had zero likes and he trained a DC GAN in them. And, so he made, and then he made a Twitter account that would post them, um, that would post like random sort of like, um, Man, like random generations from that DC GAN. So, and then he would use another neural network uh, to caption them. So you have neural networks that can do, that can apply captions to images. And so this was generated. And then there's a, there's a caption that goes, man takes a picture of himself. And if you look at it long enough, right? It looks like a worship painting, right? Like, I think I showed this on the first day, right? Did I? Uh, maybe not. In any case, like it's one of those like have you ever taken like one of those psycho psychological tests where they show you like a random thing and then you have to interpret it, right? right? This is Worsher diagram, right? This is kind of that I like to think of it. Like you can see, kind of see like for me I see the camera, right there. So it's like he's like kind of like taking a picture of himself, and then the one on the left is I love this one. Dog looks at a cat in the mirror. Right, which is really, it's just like a very strange thought if you think about it. But you can see the dog. Like, I see the dog, there's a tongue and a nose. And I think that's the cat right there. Right? And also, I really like a, a man and a woman are eating a sandwich. Notice that it's memorized the cheesy Instagram filters. Uh, this is a really recent project by Anna Riddler, who's a friend of mine. She's generating uh, tulips. And this is kind of like, I think, a, co um, a commentary on, on sort of... Uh, like rising and falling cryptocurrency prices, if I'm not mistaken. Um, basically, like there's a project she's uh, debuting very soon. Now, anyway, anyhow, like since GANs came out, they have just been like all over the place. There has been um, uh, like tons and tons of research into them since uh, late 2015. When I made a book from the sky, it was 2015, so we were here. And now it's like these things have just like skyrocketed. There's all these different varieties of different kinds of GANs. Um, all of these different exotic um, like versions of GANs that have various properties. 
Um, and, and there's been an explosion of interest in them because they're really, really good at, at being generative models. They, they synthesize really realistic looking samples and you're going to see like increasingly realistic stuff. This was um, from 2017, Boundary Equilibrium GANs. This was kind of an update on DC GANs that, that seemed to improve the, uh, the, the like, realism, at least the faces. Uh, it, it, it didn't necessarily work so well in other kinds of categories, but, um, but in any case, like, it makes what looked like pretty realistic looking synthetic faces. Now, some of them are really odd, like they're weirdly discolored, like, like Avatar or something like that. That looks like Avatar, right? Um, but nevertheless, like they look pretty realistic, even though they're they're totally fake. Um, the, again, like this is just like I'm not going to exhaustively cover all the different kinds of GANs, but there's lots of interest in structuring GANs so that they have various kinds of desirable properties. So, for example, this info GAN, information maximizing GAN, put additional constraints in the latent space, in which uh, it was trained in such a way that the different elements of the latent space. It, it tried to basically have a maximum amount of what's called mutual information between the between the different um, between the different elements of the latent space, and if you train it that way, then then the actual like each of the actual elements in the latent space become very interpretable by themselves. Like one of them might control the rotation of the generated object, one might control the width. Of the of the chair, one might control the elevation or the pitch or the lighting or all of these other other kinds of features, and you can imagine why that would be super useful, right? Because we want to use GANs in, in let's say design software, and designers, uh, you know, need to have ways of modulating the the high level features that they care about, right? And you don't want to have to do like like just random samples to try to get what you want. You need to be able to actually change the 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 Z space accordingly to, to whatever your demands are. Um, deep generate. I'm just showing you like other stuff. Deep generator networks came out in 2017, and this is almost a com. This is like sort of a combination of deep dream in a sense and 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 generative adversarial networks because basically it like takes a latent code and produces an image, but then it's the latent code itself is optimized inside of an optimization process so as to maximize the uh, a particular class label. So let's say you're trying to generate candles, um, then it's, it's modulating the latent code through an optimization process until the image that generates uh, maximally activates the candle neuron, right? So for example, this is a macaw. Oh, oops, that's, that's a, yeah, this is a macaw. It's a bird, right? And, um, Basically, this is the process of actually optimizing that code, so it so it optimally activates the macaw neuron. And this on the left is a cheeseburger being optimized. This is still two networks in an adversarial, not as an adversarial. The, the, it is, but there's also this other aspect, like this the the the, the no the, the sort of deep dream optimization type thing. And obviously, there's a teapot. I made, I made these two because this was around Seagraph, I think. So I was like, you know, the Seagraph teapot. Um, so how's that cheeseburger looking? It's good, right? Um, these are generated from a data set called face, uh, Places to 365. So look at these, like art gallery, auditorium, ballroom, butcher shop, conference room, gas station, snowfield, picnic area, museum. I love the museum. It's like really whack. <laughs> Um, imaginary places, so balconies, beach houses, general stores, soccer fields, pizzerias, hostels, and so on. I took some of these. Uh, took uh, okay, so like you get a lot of variety, right? So every time you hit, you throw in a different input code, you get, you get a different image. And so these are buttes, right? So we have these out west, these sort of canyon-looking features. I like this. This is the boathouses, and the boathouses are cool because you notice that um, the water seems to have reflections. That's really cool. Like we didn't tell this network anything about water or about reflections, but it learned through examples that images of things that are on top of water tend to have reflections, right? And the reflections are actually pretty good. Like look at this one, um, the one over here. Like it pretty much matches what's actually above the water. Uh, but then I also like this one over here, where, oh, wait, wait, which of these, like, yeah, this one. I think the, the, it sort of forgot what's above it and the reflections don't match. 
So it's kind of like a little bit of a horror film quality to it, right? It's like the reflection doesn't match reality. This is a discotheque. <laughs> um, I love the way that people come out in these. So nursing home, legislative chamber. That looks like a certain president. <laughs> I, I don't know which one. It's, well, and then like, like the golf course and so on, reception. Um, now, uh, Mike Taika, who is one of the primary um, uh, contributors to Deep Dream, he, um, he uh, was combining GANs with like uprising techniques to make synthetic imaginary people. He was doing this before we, we had really, really high resolution GANs and he came out with some really, really cool looking images of, of like not real people. Um, so you can see that there. Now here's where things get really crazy. Um, so about six months ago, I think roughly six months, uh, maybe almost a year actually now, progressive growing of GANs. This was released by NVIDIA where they used like a lot of GPU power on a data set of high resolution celebrity faces. And they used this technique where they would grow the, the layers of the GAN progressively. So, so basically like they would start by generating four by four outputs and then they would grow it to eight by eight and then to 16 by 16 and then 32 by 32. And they were able to go all the way up to 1024 by 1024 pixels, just huge resolution increases and they were able to generate pretty realistic looking faces, right? I mean, you see stubble, you see like the glint in people's eyes, you see hair follicles. Uh, sometimes the faces go a little bit weird, but, but they look pretty realistic, right? And so this is what a difference two, two or three years makes. So we had GANs producing like weird looking sort of discolored faces, you know, uh, all the way back in 2015, they looked like this. To, late 2015, they looked like this. So, and they were 32 by 32 pixels. And then late 2017, they are up to this, right? So that's just the march of realism. Like really, really kind of like uh, very, very fast progress, right? High resolution realism. Um, as a joke, I tried to run the, the uh, they posted like a one hour long video of celebrity, generated celebrity faces. And as a joke, I tried to run it through a face, a face recognition thing that was trained on celebrities. And so these were synthetic faces that, uh, that the face recognition thing matched to a celebrity. And so that's like, I don't know about Chris Rock so much, but that's totally Renee Zellweger. Is that not Renee Zellweger, right? So here's a few of more of those. So Salma Hayek, Ben Stein. <laughs> um, Kate Moss, Robert De Niro, yeah, Matt Damon, Rick Santorum. That's like a very that's like a very cool looking Rick Santorum, you know, like sort of celebrity Rick Santorum. This is my favorite. <laughs> Mother Teresa and Rodney Dangerfield. Actually, like the face recognition system actually thought both of both of those. So Rodney Rodney Dangerfield and Mother Teresa, yeah. Um, now the cool thing about progressive GANs, um, besides for the fact that they produce like high resolution images, super high resolution, super realistic looking images, is that they release their model, they release the code and the models that they train. So you can actually download these models and use them to synthesize samples of cats and bicycles and cars and bedrooms, TV screens and phone screens and so on. So these, I actually made these with their models, right? Um, and that, that hasn't happened so much where the, the, the re researchers actually released the models that they generated. So that's pretty cool. I, f as I found that like, okay, they have this, you know, the cats are trained on images of cats from the internet. And so many images of cats from the internet have memes on them, right? Because that's just the internet, right? And so this is the meme vector. See the blocky looking letters everywhere. Uh, and these were contributed by different people who use progressive GANs. This guy made generative ramen. And Andreas made eyes. Those are just 256 pixels, I think. Um, similarly, like this isn't a progressive GAN, but someone generated a, uh, a some, I, I'm not sure actually, I think ProGAN is something else. But basically they trained it on uh, the, this subreddit on Reddit called EarthPorn. 
where people just sh have beautiful images of the earth and so you train like a GAN on, on earth porn. Um, Robbie Barrett um, made um, this guy on Twitter, Dr. Beef. He basically trained progressive GANs on uh, nude portraits from wiki arts and then generated his own wiki, uh, he generated his own nude portraits. Um, Rafik Anadol, uh, this artist, he, he worked with Mike Taika on, on basically taking a, a uh, an archive of documents from, I don't remember where actually, oh, the, the uh, uh, some sort of a library collection. I, I forgot actually, it, all the details are on the website. But basically, uh, there's a, you're surrounded by these, and it's generating fake documents which is really kind of neat. This is something I made. Uh, basically, this is trained on all of WikiArts. So I downloaded like 100,000 images uh, for, of, of like public domain paintings from WikiArts. And then I trained the Progressive GAN to generate them. And so it has all sorts of kinds of paintings on it. Landscapes and portraits and abstract paintings and Baroque paintings and, you know, classical paintings, graffiti, um, documents and so on. And this learns a latent space for all of it, right? And so it just goes on forever. It just generates like infinite looking paintings, right? Of, of all sorts of different qualities. I really like to show these because it's, this is a single model learning all of these, right? It's got real looking people in it. It's got, it's got abstract, uh, abstract paintings. It has so much capacity. Uh, it's really kind of impressive. This is some work from OpenAI on what are called invertible, uh, I forget, reversible uh, neural networks. So there are ways to actually make generative models reversible to the latent code. Like I mean, you can kind of do this with autoencoders, but it's not quite the same. But the point is that with this approach, they're able to embed a real face into, uh, like they're able to kind of, like we've actually looked at the demo. They embed a, uh, real faces into the latent space and then, uh, they, yeah, they have these invertible one-by-one -one convolutions that let you basically take a person's face and, and find the latent code associated with it so you could generate the synthetic version of your own face, let's say, and then mess with all the characteristics of it, right? So this is the actual person. This is a person's face that's been embedded into the space. And then you can, like, change how much it's smiling. Right. You can make it older. Make the eyes narrower. Give it a beard. <laughs> More blonde hair. Less blonde hair. So that's really cool. Um, then like this is, yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of really cool stuff. I think they have, you can read about it there. I want to keep going through it because, because we're running out of time. So, um, okay, then now this is, I think this is the last thing I'll show you about again. So three weeks ago, um, these so-called big GANs were, were trained uh, maybe a month ago now. So these are the most realistic looking samples that anyone's ever seen. Like, I mean, like if I hadn't told you that these were generated by GANs, would you think they're, would you think they're fake? Like maybe if you look at it for long enough, you might think it's fake, but that dog is seriously like seriously serious. Yeah. Like, uh, that cheeseburger, right? Like, like makes you maybe some of you who haven't had lunch, it might actually like make you a little hungry. Um, the islands and so on. Look at these other dogs, mushrooms. Look, it even captures like depth of field. It has a weird depth of field thing going on here. The bubble looks realistic. The rocket looks realistic. It's just all really, really like incredibly hyper realistic, right? And so we're approaching hyper realism, I think, with Gans. I think in another one to two years, this will be widespread. And so that's pretty interesting, right? And so we're in the early days of, uh, of, the, of this, but we were definitely making a lot of progress. This is a really cool thing. I don't have enough time to, to really talk about it in much detail, but it's kind of cool that like, um, um, so they, they basically, these researchers basically, they did this thing where they trained again on, uh, on a data set of you know, various sorts of images and they conditioned it on the fMRI activity of a person who's watching or looking at those images, right? So basically they put, they, they put a bunch of, you know, like electrodes or whatever, on whatever you used to, uh, 
you put an fMRI device on somebody and then you show them images of you know owls and animals and whatever and then you measure the their fMRI activity at that point and then you basically train uh, again which is conditioned on the fMRI uh, on the fMRI activity that's your latent space basically is the fMRI activity and you condition it on that so then what you can do then is to try to then you take a second person let's say and you measure their fMRI activity and you try to synthesize a sample from the GAN which is conditioned on whatever that person happens to be basically it's trying to like re it's trying to redraw your imagination like for real like I think in the future like imagine you'll be able to record your dreams so like the neural yeah. the, the, the activity of your brain is the vector that you're feeding into like the yeah, that's the, like the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe in the future we'll be able to like basically record dreams to like draw to synthesize dreams. That might not be. That might be a little more difficult because it turns out that like um, perception and imagination are, are kind of like not exactly using the same neurons. But um, but maybe like something like this in that direction. Like I don't know. I, I think we might have some really fun like applications for this in the future. Actually, um, the French contemporary artist Pierre Huig uh, is having a show at the Serpentine Gallery that's basically just like using this stuff. So all of this stuff is like finally now crossing over into the into like the contemporary art world, which means that I have to get out of it, basically. But <laughs> so skip dot vectors. I want to tell you very quickly about um, about generative models in other domains. So there, we've been talking about images mostly, but there are also, um, generative models in the domain of language and in the domain of music, and um, we haven't really discussed recurrent neural networks yet, so uh, so I can't really like fully uh, specify exactly how this is done. But just to be aware of it, we'll talk about recurrent neural networks later, and we'll talk about these generative language models uh, in a few weeks. But for now, just know that you can actually like create language models which do something like take an image. Of, uh, of you know like the well that you can you can take an image let's say of the of the um, beach here and then uh, generate like a little story about it right so we were barely able to catch the breeze at the beach and it felt as if someone stepped out of my mind so it's basically trained on romance novels I think and then basically just generating little stories about about the pictures did I show this in the first week I think I might have um, we'll talk about conditional models uh, later. Let me skip this actually. Um, adversarial generation of 3D point clouds. Um, so for those of you who are interested in 3D point clouds, you can do there are generative models for those too. I haven't seen any open source code for it, and, and data sets are very sparse as well. So this might be a little bit hard to, to use. But um, but in the future you should like I would start collecting your data sets now if you're interested in this because in the future you should be able to have. 3D generative models, like of meshes and voxels and, and point clouds. Um, WaveNets, generative models for audio based on neural networks. So listen to this. It's pretty crazy, right? And there's also sample RNN, which is another type of generative audio model. There's an open source version of WaveNet, uh, which I used to train this. Uh, this I, so I trained the WaveNet on the Barber of Sevilla opera, and so uh, this is. Oops. So this is what that sounds like: Barber of Sevilla WaveNet. Do you hear like, like a sort of like? There's a little bit of an opera. But like there's a sort of operatic element to it. Anyway, the open source version is not quite as good as the one that, Wave, that WaveNet is based on. They had like a million GPUs to train on or something like that. Um, let me skip the closed captioning thing. Yeah, you can, uh, there's been some recent updates to WaveNets uh, that, uh, that are becoming increasingly coherent. So listen to this. Oh. 
So, so you can hear the long-term coherence of these things is improving. Um, and again, this is a sample by sample generative model. It's not MIDI. It's actually producing the audio file, right? So completely synthetic recording. Like it's not a recording, it's just synthetic audio. So that's, that's something that's pretty crazy. Right? different it's not using a it's not using it again um, it's actually a, just a cup net so we don't have time to get into the details but it's not um, it, it, it doesn't have that like a length vector uh, so talking about ghost in the machine right uh, for those of you who are interested I haven't used magenta or Encent at all but for those of you who are interested uh, magenta which is a group at Google has made a lot of like really cool musical instruments based off of the uh, wave nets so for example, they made this Ensynth Super, or I think the Creative Lab made the Ensynth Super. So this is all software that you can use online for those of you who are interested in it. So you have this generative synthesis model that you can kind of interpolate between different characteristics. models are being generated in real time so you know I think I can't guess really but but definitely like I think you'll so see crazy. it sorry it's not so crazy no, to no, no, no. Yeah, yeah also this thing's only 8 bit 60 kilohertz audio yeah. Yeah. which they have an internal one of this 24 but they haven't released it oh is that right yeah. okay it's too slow they just have I think it's probably too 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 valuable <laughs> yeah right yeah <laughs> Um, check this out. Uh, Lyrebird.ai is a company that is working on generative voice models. So, um, so the first one here is. Hey, Doc, have you heard about this new technology? Does that guy sound familiar? About this new algorithm to copy voices. Yes, it is developed by a startup called Lyrebird. This is you. They can make us say anything now, really anything. Hey, Doc, the have you is, heard about this new technology? technology? Are you speaking thing? about this, this new algorithm to copy voices? Work. Yes, hey, it is developed by a startup called Wirebird. This is you. They can make us say anything now, really anything. The good great. news is they will offer the technology to anyone. This is you. The Obama one is really good, Hey, guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural networks. Okay, fine. It's like you can tell it apart from, but like, again, like a year or two ago no way um, so uh, they have a demo online where you can they ask you to read like like you know 50 sentences and then they make a generative model of your voice and so this is this is my voice reading reading the um, this is the reading these sentences so re, so listen to this this is, this is me Oak is strong and also gives shade the pipe began to rust while you eat to rock friends deserve jail, jail. the ripe right. taste of cheese improves with age cats and dogs each hate the other move the bat over the hot fire the hot crawl under the high pass. Oak is strong and also gives shade. Speed. The pipe began to rust while new. <laughs> Thieves who robbed friends deserve jail. It's a little robotic sounding, but, but I really taste captures the temper of the voice, right? Cats and dogs each so hate the other. So again, like, Move the bat like over it's the only a matter of time before, you can, crawled under the before high you can basically steal people's Act on these orders with great speed. So think about that. Um, okay, so we're at the end of the slides, and now I'm going to do basically move on to the tutorials. And actually, we have more time than I thought we would. Uh, we're, we're doing pretty good. So basically, um, most of the stuff that I'm showing you is, get, is based on TensorFlow, and I'm going to show you the following things. We're going to try to try to get through um, in the next. Uh, not all of this, but basically, right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few utilities for getting data sets and how to use them, including some of mine and and also some um, some really handy scraper utilities that were made by your. Your cohort here, a f former student at ITP named Aaron Montoya, um, who was a resident last year, I think. 
Uh, he's got some really nice utilities that we're going to look at. I'm also going to show you places where you can get data sets. Data sets in general are just uh, sort of like, you know, they're disorganized, they're all over the place. Um, and they're valuable, so it's not necessarily always easy to find data sets, in particular for, for things like DCGAN, which are very data hungry, uh, progressive GANs especially. It's not always easy to find um, data sets which are very large, but hopefully some of these, I'll put the slides up online so you'll have these links. Uh, but, um, but, well, so yeah, let, let's start with data set processing and then we'll get into how to train DCGAN on paper space. Um, so let me get out of, okay, so the, yeah, the first thing I'll show you is this Instagram sc scraper. This is really, this is a GitHub project that basically is a free Instagram sc scraper. Um, it doesn't, requ it, it just requires basically that you input your username and your password. So you have to have an Instagram account to use it. I'm not going to demonstrate it because I would have to pull my password on the screen, but I ran it yesterday to download a few different Instagram uh, accounts. It's really easy. So you pip install it and then you just go, okay, Instagram scrape, you know, whoever demo IG scraper, and then it'll download a bunch of their images. So for example, I downloaded, uh, let me see if I can find this. Did, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. So I downloaded my own Instagram and then I also, uh, where did I put this scrapers? Uh, oh, I forgot where I put them. Uh, I downloaded um, a couple of data sets of sunsets and oh, I must have erased them actually. Scrapers. I forgot where I put them, but basically I found, I downloaded all of the, um, I think sunset stream. Oh, it goes by user? Yeah. Oh, you can also do, I think, by hashtag, and it has some other features. You, you can read the documentation. How, how much can you use it before you get banned? Uh, you, it, it, it's it's not using an API. It's, it's right, scraping. Right. So the, I the behavior I'm imagining is gonna. I'm not. I'm not sure. Flag. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, in any case, like I downloaded all of these seven thousand images from Sunset Stream. So um, so it's pretty easy. There's a lot of Instagram accounts that have enough images to train a whole DC GAN. So like, if you can do some some reconnaissance work and find some interesting uh, images. I, I like Googled what uh, Instagram accounts have the most images. And so for example, like I learned that, um, like for example, like Snoop Dogg, like really, really loves his Instagram, 38,000 posts. So I downloaded Snoop Dogg also. I like downloaded one third of them before I stopped. So I started to train a DC again on Snoop Dogg's, uh, on Snoop Dogg's Instagram feed. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, okay, this is one of these questions that's a little bit hard to answer in specificity because the devil's in the details. So it really depends on sort of like the, the, uh, on a number of factors. One is the complexity of the data. So if you have a data set, if the thing that you're training is remarkably coherent, like let's say you're always training numbers, right? There's a very small amount of diversity in images of numbers, right? And so you can get away with a very small number of, uh, of images, you know, maybe just a thousand or two thousand or whatever, if you have a low amount of diversity and you're not making too many, too many pixels. But for something like Snoop Dogg's Instagram stream, right? There's, there's, I mean, it's just all over the place. It's like tons of tons of different stuff, right? And so for this, like having thirty-eight thousand is actually pretty useful, right? So like in general, generally speaking, the more the better but aim for at least 5,000, let's say, if you can. Um, you can do it even on 1,000, but, but then you might encounter some problems. So one problem with DCGAN that's kind of often, or just with GANs in general, is something called mode collapse, where basically it begins to just output the same thing over and over. So it just like memorizes one kind of image and then it just, or, or a very small amount of them. So the diversity of the thing kind of crashes. So those are all things that you may potentially have to deal with. Um, but in any case, like Instagram is a great resource. Another really nice resource is, um, yeah, so Aaron Montoya Moraga um, has a bunch of scraping utilities for scraping Google images 
scraping Bing images. He has his own Instagram scraper, which works a little bit differently than the one I showed you. I think the one that I showed you is probably a little bit more robust, but it was actually broken a few months ago, and I guess they just fixed it recently. So like, you know, in general, like there's different ways of scraping things. And so if one is not working, you might want to turn to the other. Um, but uh, Aaron made this, these two really awesome Google image and Bing image scrapers that use, that basically uh, like fake being a browser or use um, the Chrome driver to basically, uh, how many of you have used Selenium? So, Selenium? Okay, some of you, so lots of you have done some scraping stuff. So this is really awesome. Like I, I've been testing it and it works really, really fantastically. So let's actually show. Um, basically, let me make this bigger. So um, I trust that some of you have now watched Terminal Velocity, so or should be pretty comfortable with it, with the terminal. We're going to be using the terminal for everything now, basically. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to my documents, and I put the scrapers here. So scrapers, and then he has this um, like okay. So let's look at this the the Google scraper, scrape Google images. And the script is, I think, Python, my, what is it, script? Script.py, and then in quotation marks, the thing that you want to search for, right? So let's say you want to search for puppies. And uh, then you also want, and then a number. So like how many you want to scrape. So let's say we'll scrape just 50 just for now. And what, what this will do, it, oh, what? I thought I, oh, what is going on here? Um, BIP3 install Selenium. There we go, okay, fine. So here it is, and now it's looking at puppies, and it's basically just going through, um, yeah, look at that. Chrome is being controlled by automated test software. And 888, yeah. Some of them don't save all the time, but basically we can actually, yeah, there we go. Now it's beginning to save the images. I, I'm sorry, does it do what? It just scrapes the results of the Google image search, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can look at see what's going on. What it does, it's kind of it's kind of weird. So it'll, um, so Google images. I already did this puppies. It's basically re-downloading them, and then it'll download them here without extensions for some reason. I'm not sure why. But then when it's done, it converts them all to JPEG. So this is like at 35. Once it's at 50, it's going to convert them into JPEG. I did this yesterday, so they're actually already here. Oh no, that's that's sunsets. So here's the puppies. These are being downloaded right now. And then when it's done, you'll have a lot of images. I downloaded 500 yesterday. Images of puppies. This is not adorable. So 500 is not a. What was that? <laughs> oh! <laughs> These are adorable, aren't they? So I, I downloaded those. I also downloaded Sunsets. Sunsets is always a pretty good one. So this is some Google Images Sunsets. He's also sorry. That's fine. We'll we'll deal with that. Yeah, um, yeah. That's something that you do have to deal with. So then, yeah, then it converts them to JPEG. Now, um, I think there's also a Bing Images Scraper, which, which actually I had some trouble using it yesterday, so I'm not sure it might be broken at the moment. The Bing Images Scraper might actually be better than the Google Images one because Google Images like goes to certain lengths to try to avoid being scraped. And so like credit Aaron for, for like digging through their insanely complicated like, um, you know, HTML5 code. So, but in any case, like that's something that you have access to. Um, so you have access to those scrapers. There's a lot of data sets that are available and like there's various resources for looking at them. So there's this uh, Google doc that was started by Golan Levin where just a bunch of us have been like uh, collecting 
links to publicly available data sets that you can go through. So they're written like how many images there are in theory. Um, these are very like, like there's no guarantees that any of these are very useful, but you can definitely go through these and see if any of them appeal to you because lots of them, there's plenty of, of image data sets that have, you know, thousands of images at least. Um, not all of them are easily downloadable. Um, oh, another thing is there's the Met archive. So there's a, you can download the entire collection of the Met. So they have an API for, and it's huge. It's like 200,000 images or something like that, if not more. Um, so museum artifacts and so on. Um, these are just a few more links that we can kind of look through of like just sort of collections. So image data sets, CV for CV. Awesome public data sets is a GitHub repository that, that this looks really good. It looks like it has like just a whole bunch of links to publicly available data sets. Um, another one data science like list of public data sets in Git, GitHub. This might, these might uh, intersect a little bit. So in general, like if you're interested in looking for images, I would, I would ex go exploring for, through some of these and you might get some good ideas. Another one I found like a few weeks ago, um, Chinese food net. This is huge. This is like 2 million images of Chinese food dishes. It's just, and it's, and it's labeled into like, like, okay, look at this. This is like the best data. Someone has got to use this because it's like one of the best structured data sets. Okay. Scrambled egg with cucumber. <laughs> streamed egg custard pork liver and like it has images of each of those dishes and like i forget how many categories there are there's there's 200 categories um of different chinese and they're and they're high resolution so the and and gigantic so like i would it's like like a few terabytes or something no that's not that's an exaggeration i think it's like 20 gigabytes of images um so i would i definitely like i'm pushing hard for somebody to train again on these uh, because it should come out looking really good because it, it's like, it, like I think a Chinese food data set captures, like, it, it, it's, it's a good halfway point. It's, it's like diverse enough to get different kinds of dishes, but it's not all the same thing, like, like numbers. So there's kind of like, it's all, they're all food dishes. So there's kind of uniformity there. You know, you'll see a lot of plates and stuff. Uh, but, there, but of course, there's a lot of different meals. And so there's actually like a generative model of Chinese food would be really, really cool. Um, then... Oh yeah, and this is object scans, so like connect, like type, not connect, but, but uh, 3D scans of objects. This might not be that big, but for anyone who's interested in working with depth maps, that might be a pretty interesting one. Okay, so suppose that you've downloaded a data set. Okay, let's say like, let's say we want to take the, oops, uh, let's say we want to take this uh, thing that we scraped, we scraped a whole bunch of images of puppies. And uh, you want to prepare them for, um, for post-processing. So for that, uh, or you want to prepare them for DCGAN, they have to be sort of cropped and formatted into RGB images of the same dimensions. And actually, I think maybe some of the DCGAN repositories allow you to put in different sized images and it resizes them automatically. But if you want to have a little bit more control, it's better to do the pre-processing yourself. And for that, I have a utility on ML4A guides, uh, which basically in ML4A guides, if you go to utils, you'll see there's this handy dandy script called dataset utils, which I'm going to show you how to use. So basically you can take dataset utils, point it to a folder of images, and then specify how you want to you basically uh, process it. And we're going to use this next week too for doing picks to picks preparation, but let me show you how to use it. So basically what you would do is you would go to, I have, I have it inside of ML4A guides. So there's ML4A guides right there. So I'm going to go to ML4A guides and CD to data. And then basically you'll see there's this, uh, oh wait, sorry, not CD into data, CD into utils. Now there's this, uh, the file is called dataset utils. And if you do Python, uh, dataset utils.py dash dash help. Uh, oh, um, actually, on this computer, I have it set up with Python 3, um, whichever one works for you. So you could use it in this computer if you wish. Uh, it does have some dependencies. So, like, um, the easiest place to get it set up would be inside of um, a paper space because it has all the dependencies already set up. So, here's the documentation for it. 
basically the main thing you need to do is to, to supply these. So first you go input source. So we'll, we're going to, let me, basically I'm going to do Python data set, Python 3 data set utils.py input source and that's going to be my folder of puppies and I can just drag that in from finder there's my puppies so I'm going to throw that in here so that's my input source and then we're going to say okay uh, do I want to shuffle the images let's shuffle them if I want a minimum dimension like we'll let all of them pass through so that's just a um, then where are we going to put where are we going to put the output images so let's put them inside of output there. Let's let's just make a new folder called my puppies. That'll put it in the same folder. You can give it a, a direct a, a full path if you want. Then we we say okay, width. Let's make them 512 by 512. And so if the image is landscape and it's wider than it is tall, it'll take a five. It'll take a square crop. A random square crop unless you want it to be centered so it'll take a random square crop somewhere and then resize it to 512 by 512 and if it's taller then it'll be a random you know lengthwise crop it'll it, it'll basically take as big of a crop as it can no 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 it could be whatever you want yeah yeah um, but I'm, I'm making them uh, one to one because we're gonna train DC again on images that are that size. But let's say we want them to be like 128 by 128 actually, because we're gonna train a DC again at resolution of 128. So we say 128, 128, and I also wanted to take the center crop. So by default, it'll do like a random crop because it's it's kind of set up to just do random crops, but you can do centered and that will make it just take the center crop. And then there's, there's a bunch of things that you could do to like, for example, num per, you could, for example, instead of just doing one every image once, you could make copies of the image and do random crops. So you could, you could make a data set bigger by taking random crops of a single image. And you can do a lot of augmentation stuff. So for example, it could do a random rotation, a random stretching. This is all for what's called augmentation, which means making your data sets bigger by artificially distorting the images that you have and making copies of them. Another thing that you can do is, um, like I, I have this data set utils does a lot more than what I'm gonna show you today. I'm gonna to show you more of this to, uh, next week, but you can do things like extract faces, extract faces of specific people. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I've kind of set this up to do. It's gonna be kind of like a nice little, just a utility that we can use over and over and over. But in any case, like I'm, I have it set up, this is, this is good enough for now. So basically when I'm gonna run this, and now it should begin to, going on here process oops oh action right there's one last thing so action is what do you want how do you want to process the image so uh, I, I have stuff for making it basically like um, e either tra making a segmentation of the image or making tracing the image but for, for now I actually don't want to do anything to it I don't I just want to take the raw image so the action will just be none and then one other thing is the um, save mode um, so save mode right here and save extension so save extension is do you want jpegs or pngs let's do save extension jpeg and then save mode basically is is do you want to save just the the image that you generate just the output image or do you want to take the input and the output like if you do some sort of a tracing or whatever on top of it you have an input and you have an output do you want to save them together? Do you want to save them split up? Like we'll, we're going to use them split, uh, save them together next week because we're going to make picks to picks data sets. So this can make picks to picks data sets as well. Uh, but what we want is we're actually just post processing the image to make them smaller crops. And so we're just going to we're just going to do output only. Save mode, output only, uh, and that's it. So basically now I'll run this. It starts to run Python. And in the moment, it should, there we go. So it goes pretty quickly. It's going through 500 images, 497 images, and it's putting them into a new folder, which is inside, it's just inside of here now. So if I go over to utils, there it is, my puppies. So if we look at this, 
Now it's a data set of the same images that we had, except they're, re they're, they're centered 128 by 128 crops. Okay, so tiny puppies. Right? So this is something that you can use to do pre-processing of your data set. Okay, so um, any questions about that, first of all? Um, of course, I know like you'll you'll get a little bit of practice with this. Like I, I, I just made this tool, so if there are things that are unclear about it, you know I'm still documenting it. Like please do let me know. And like it, it is it is actually a very straightforward tool to use once you know um, how to set it up. And so you don't have to use it. Like lots of people have their own tools for for doing processing of data. Um, maybe some of you have have other methods that you use to pre-process data, uh, but this is just for your convenience. Oh, I forgot to mention another thing I have is a wiki wiki art scraper. So that's also in oops, uh, that's also here inside of utils. So if we do Python three scrape wiki art dash dash help, this basically goes okay. You specify a genre. So all these are the options: portrait, landscape, genre painting, abstract, or you can you can do a style. And then how many pages you want to scrape? because WikiArts is, is segmented into pages, and then where to put them. So basically I'm gonna do Python3 scrape wikiart.py, and we'll do style, let's say, um, what's, a, what's a very distinct one? Socialist realism. Socialist realism. It, where is it, socialist dash realism? Dash dash style, so let's do num pages three, and then output there is going to be socialist realism okay so now it gathers the links to the image and then it sets up a threaded oh oh right i have to oh right the output directory is the root directory so we'll just say output there is here so now it's going to make a folder called socialist realism that's inside of the root directory and it's three pages so it's downloading 122 images if you leave num pages blank it'll download as many images as possible so like, uh, so like uh, WikiArts has, for example, like 10,000 landscapes. So you can scrape 10,000 landscapes, um, 10,000 portraits, and you know, there's just lots and lots of images. Uh, was that, is it done? Oh yeah, okay, so now we can look at that. So there's socialist realism. There's our socialist realism. That's pretty cool, right? And we can get a lot more than, than 100. Uh, no, no, not all of the categories have many paintings, um, but, but they, uh, but yeah. So check this out. We can also, like, I can post-process this. So data set utils, now we'll do, instead of the puppies, we're going to, we're going to set them up, like, okay, let's output them into, let's make 128 by 128, versions of the socialist realism photos. So the input source for this is going to be, I just gotta erase this, socialist realism, All right? So socialist realism, um, go. Okay, so now this is going to give us a random uh, or centered crops of, here they are. So it's pretty quick, like we can make data sets nice and quickly, really tiny. Uh, we will look at some of the higher resolution ones as well, um, but remember like like two and a half years ago, like 32 pixels was it. So things have gotten a lot better. Okay, so that's the sort of data set util stuff. Um, okay. So now what I want to do is I want to show you how to use DCGAN TensorFlow. Now, in principle, DCGAN TensorFlow is not very difficult to use. Like, really, the, the most difficult thing about doing these things is generally um, just obtaining a computational environment and obtaining a data set. Those are really the things that you'll spend the most time doing. DCGAN TensorFlow is essentially a command line tool. So it's really easy to use, and once you know how to use the command line tool, you can use it like, you know, like really easily. Now the way I'm going to show you how to use it is using paper space. However, in, in general, 
um, uh, like you can is wherever you can get an environment that has GPUs, you'll be able to use DCGET and TensorFlow. Uh, and I'm also going to show you how to use it inside a paper spaces gradient. Uh, here's a question. So since I put out last week terminal velocity, how many people here have set up paper spaces accounts? Okay. Um, so one thing that like I, I will want everybody to try to set up a computational environment for themselves. Paper space is the easiest one. You do have to put in the credit card, but but it's not. It doesn't cost that much money for educational purposes. It just costs like fifty cents per hour. Um, so I hope you don't mind that too much. There's also like at some point at AI Lab, we'll probably have a session on how to use HPC, which everyone here has access to. HPC is a little bit a little bit like a little bit harder to use, so it's not necessarily um, not necessarily a thing that I will use in the lectures because paper space is kind of the easiest. Uh, but it is like more powerful and free. I don't think so. Uh, I, yeah, Shiftman should be able to do it. Yeah. Um, I don't. So, um, so I'm I'm going. So basically, yeah. Like for those of you who want to use paper space, like this, it's pretty easy to use this in paper space. Now, um, there's kind of two ways of interfacing with paper space. There is using a VM, like like actually spinning up a machine in the cloud and then just accessing that machine and everything. There's also a service on Paperspace called Gradient. And uh, I've been using Gradient. I'm, I'm debating whether or not to show you through, through using Gradient or using, Paperspa or using Paperspace VMs. The difference between Gradient and the VMs is that Gradient is, a, is just a job runner. So you kind of work locally and then you send jobs to the job runner and it runs those jobs and then sends you back the results and 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 then uh and basically you only pay for when it's running the job um, so basically with paper space vms it's like you start a machine and then you're paying for it as long as the machine is run is is is, is on um, so gradient is, is actually quite convenient it's just a little bit like weirder because basically you have this notion of like sending things to the job runner rather than interfacing with a computer um, I'm going to show you very quickly how to do this in Gradient because it will be recorded so you will see me do everything from scratch. And so if certain things are confusing, you can always go back to the recording. Uh, but it should be relatively straightforward. The other nice thing about Gradient is that you don't have to get permission to use the GPUs. Uh, if you start a paper space account and you try to get a GPU, it, uh, you have to actually, uh, it has a pop-up the first time that asks you to like send them a reason. It's just a security thing. Like they don't want people like spam bots to, to get GPUs. It doesn't even matter what you put down. Like be like, I'm doing deep learning experiments or, or like, or even tell them that you're taking my class because they know me and they'll give you a machine. Um, and then you only have to do that once. And so that's that's not a big deal. Uh, but Gradient, you don't have to get permission at all. So it's kind of nice. And so it's, it's once you get used to Gradient, I've been just using it this week, so I'm not even really that used to it myself. But once you get used to Gradient, it's pretty nice. So let me show you how to use it. So in paper space, you have your console and basically you have to have at least one machine that you can put storage into. So there's this, uh, so there's a, all of your things on paper space will have a, uh, like simultaneous access to a special folder that paper space makes for you called storage, which has persistent storage on it. So if you make different job runners, they can access your storage folder. If you make different VMs, they can access your storage folder. It's just your persistent storage. And so basically, I have one machine here, which is a, the base, most basic machine they have. All I'm using it for is just, is just manage the storage folder. And this, this costs like, this machine to have running costs like half a penny per hour or something like that. So if you forget to leave it on or whatever, it's like really, really like, if you leave it on for a year, it'll cost you some money but like uh, not that much. So, so this is kind of for me like a really nice, nice way to interface with it. And it has a public IP. So if you, if you don't have a public IP, there's a thing here that says assign IP. And when you click that, it'll give you a public IP. And then you, oh, I don't have CyberDuck here, do I? Do I? Uh, let me, oh, I do. Let's download CyberDuck. So let me quickly just install CyberDuck here. What? <laughs> Are you kidding? No way. Download Cyberduck. Download Cyberduck for Mac. Okay. Cyberduck is just an FTP application, so this lets you interface with remote servers like file systems. 
Um, you can do it through the command line too, but it's just kind of a little easier to do this. So now I'm going to open Cyberduck. Sorry? Did you, say FTP? you can do FileZilla, yeah, yeah, whatever FTP programs you have. Um, okay, so basically I'm going to make a bookmark here. I'm going to say, okay, I want to connect over SFTP, SSH File Transfer Protocol. This is the protocol you need to use. And so we'll do, we'll call it paper space, paper space storage. And I'll say the server is basically the IP address. So I'm going to copy that. That's that right there. Put that into here, and the username is paperspace. And that's it, there's no private key. So now I bookmark that, and I can double click on it. It goes unknown fingerprint, allow, and then asks you for your password. Remember that you get a random password, and you can change that. Um, so it, I have nothing in the home folder. So this is home paperspace, there's nothing in there. If you go up a level, two levels, you'll see you're in the root folder of the machine, and there's a folder called storage. And there, the, everyone gets this public data sets that has some public data sets that are available for you. Um, and then th this, is, this is the only confusing thing. Like uh, the, depending on which data center your machine is in, you'll have a random subfolder in here. It's, they're a little hard to tell apart. Like you'll figure out which one is accessible. Like, mm -hmm. um, oops, cancel, yeah. So then I'm gonna like, for example, in here, I created these. So initially there'll be nothing in there. But I created these and I uploaded earlier, I uploaded the, this folder of sunsets. Uh, oh, I don't wanna, well, yeah. So these are all images of sunsets that I cropped at 128 by 128. Oh no, these are 512 by 512. But basically I, I ran, did random crops with data set utils and I uploaded them here. I also have Snoop folder. So that's like 7,000 images and um, this folder of animals. So I already have this, otherwise you could just drag and drop upload stuff, right? Um, I also made folder called checkpoints. Now here's what happens. When you train DCGAN, right? When you use the job runner, it generates files like your checkpoints, your models, right? And it is, um, and those go into uh, either, they, they will basically just go, like what happens is that you run the job and then it'll save the model and then it closes the machine, quits it, right? And so then it's gone, right? So that, that's one thing you want to avoid happen. That's the really like, like what you want to do is you want to make sure that you save your model to the storage folder because then you'll have it after the job is done. So basically I make this folder called checkpoints and I'm going to make sure that when I run DC again from, from, the, from Gradient, I'm going to tell it to put the checkpoint into the storage directory. So then it will be, it will be there for me later right so um, that's that's what that is for and I also made this folder called samples which generates the samples um, which which we'll, we'll use so here's what you would do um, you would then go to the job runner you go to gradient right and uh, you go to jobs I'm gonna uh, let me let me quickly like so I already have jobs here but ignore those you'll have nothing and then you go okay try the job builder Right, so this is an online interface that lets you run jobs. It's really, it's really cool. Like you, you can do this from the, from the, they, they have a tutorial on how to use this. Um, the job builder, you can, you can submit jobs online, or you can do them from your own computer. So I'm going to show you how to do it from here because it's nice and easy. So basically, we're going to select the test container, Nvidia Semi GPU test, um, and then I'm going to pick the, the 51 cent GPU. The base container is going to be test container, and then the workspace is basically like, what is the fold? What is the like the the actual repository that you're using? So what I'm actually going to use is I'm going to use DCGAN TensorFlow, this one by Carpet M, twenty by this guy Taeyun Kim, and I'm going to copy this. But actually, here's the thing. Um, uh, for now, don't use this one. Use my fork of it. And the reason why is because there's a little bug, not, not a bug, but there's a missing feature that we need to run it with Gradient that I put into my fork. I'm gonna submit a pull request to him really soon and hopefully it'll be upstream. But for now, just use mine. So then dot git, this is the reference 
to the repository. It's my fork of it, which has the changes in it. So I put that in as the workspace. And then this is the command we're going to run. The command is going to be the training command. So if we go to the training command, you'll see that you this is what you have to do. Python main.py and then a reference to the data set. So we're going to say Python main.py and then what is it? Data set. Data set. Now the data set is called um, we'll do sunsets, right? So I'll say sunsets. But here's the thing. Uh, you also have to tell it, it's not written in the, in the readme. You have to give it the root directory where your data sets are. So this is how you point it to your storage directory. You'll go data underscore dir is slash storage slash, you know, data sets. And it's and this is sort of the reference to slash storage. It's not it's not this SCZ. I don't I don't know why they do it this way. It's like that's the data center. So it's slash. So this is slash storage, and then it's going to be slash and then and then data sets. That's the root directory. So slash storage slash data sets. Public data sets would be slash public data sets. I think so. Yeah. Right. Uh, slash storage slash public data sets. Uh, uh, oh wait wait how? Would, you were saying. Oh, actually. I don't know actually. I'm not sure. That's a good question. It might it might it might not be accessible until you put it into one of those. Yeah, yeah, because that's just accessible to the VM until you move it into Got into it. one of the data center ones. So then now I'm gonna do. Um, now the thing is, if I want to use it at one, so by default it'll do 64 pixels, but I want to do 128. So I'm gonna say input underscore height 128, input underscore width 128. Oh, sorry, um, not input width, but output. So input height and output height. So input height is loaded at this resolution, and then and output height is generate and then um, trained for up to this resolution. Um, and uh, it'll make the width. The width is always identical to the height, so so it's always square. And then uh, let me just see it. And then I think one other thing. I have this written on the jobs. Is oh the checkpoint dir and the sample dir and the number of epochs yeah so we'll say now um, in so then I'll say uh, checkpoint dir this is important because we want to save the checkpoints so we're gonna put that into storage as well storage checkpoints and then the sample dir is going to be slash storage slash samples and then this is number e epoch is how many epochs to do so like let's say we just do five or whatever and then lastly to train you do dash dash train so that's the command so i'll just like put it there so make sure you have that command basically and just modify it to so that it's your own data set right so you put those, you would upload them through the FTP and then you would run the job runner basically exactly like this. Um, I think that's all. Let me just look, just make sure that. There's one other thing, this um, input F name pattern. So for example, it's looking only for JPEGs by default. Um, if you look at the, the actual folder here, my data sets, if you look at sunsets, they're actually PNGs. Oh, is it looking for, I, I forget if it's, let me just check. So you can always check what the default is by going to main.py and then this input, it's looking for JPEGs. So because we have PNGs, we have to change this. So we have to change input F name pattern if you, if you have PNGs. So what I would do is I'd go back to this and then I do one more thing here at the end or maybe before train, I would say dash dash input, oh, I have input F name pattern and then inside quotations star dot png so now it's looking for files that are called that so now if i run this so now i'm done i can click submit job and then it'll take a moment and it'll begin it puts it in a queue and then it should relatively soon begin to train and once it's training you can actually log it now I'm going to like I've already trained one, so I'm going to show you uh, like I'm going to stop it and then show you what happens as though it as though it finished. So this is like 
you ever watch one of those infomercials where they put the thing in the oven and then they like walk over to the other kitchen and then they go like, this is what happens after it's been in the oven 45 minutes. That's what I'm going to do for you. So I happen to have already trained this yesterday. How long does it take? It depends on how many epochs. So like you can, um, if let's say you have 10,000 images, then let's say 12 hours roughly, 12, 24 hours to get a good result at, at 120. May, may, you can get decent results even before then, like like three or four hours even. But maybe, you know, try to do... Do you need so 50. many to have a decent result? The more images you have, the better, typically. Like, that's, that's sort of... There's no easy, like, consistently applicable rules, but, but roughly. Um, okay, so this is running, and now you can actually look at the log. So you can see that if you click into that, you see that it has this log that's showing you what's happening. So this is what would happen if you ran it on the command line. So here, it's, it's already started. This thing is kind of annoying because it it um it refreshes every like ten seconds, so it's really hard to like. But basically, you can see it's beginning to train, so it's already giving us results. Now, what I'm going to do though is I'm going to go back to this and I'm actually going to stop it. And before I do, I'm going to copy that. I'm going to stop it. And what you can then also do, if you did the exact same thing, except removed dash dash train. So just remove the dash dash train. Then it will look for a model. It'll look for a model in that checkpoints directory and it will generate samples. So I've already done that and I downloaded the samples earlier so we could see them. So this is what happens if you had done that for sunsets. Um, I downloaded the models and I put them here. Sunsets. It's really cool, right? These are imaginary sunsets. And then I also did it for Snoop, although the, the Snoop thing didn't come out quite as like, I mean, because the thing is, there's like, it, the, the data is too heterogeneous. I didn't train it for long enough either. I like the green is a uh, primary color. Oh, that's <laughs> I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, your results will vary. Like, they'll vary quite a bit. You can also try training more than 128. They, they should be multiples of two. Um, I don't think that's a strict, I think it is a strict requirement actually. You basically have to have multiples of two, powers of two. Um, so two, like 256 might be a little bit too high for DCGAN TensorFlow. Um, there is other repositories of course that do a better job. But your training data would be larger. Actually. Yeah, um, they should be larger. What if I wanted to get a sample that is like higher resolution? You, you, you have to, the, there's a way to do that but um, it's better to just train for a, at a high resolution. Yeah, but if you have like a result that you really like, then you want it to like. You'd have to tr you have to tr retrain at the re at the resolution that you want. Yeah. So uh, before you guys get going, I, I have a couple more things to show you. I know we kind of rushed through that, but you have it. Re you'll have it recorded. So like I did everything basically from scratch, except the generating. Right. Um, it would end up in that it would ends up in your storage directory. So it it goes into here samples, and then you can just download them. Right, so that's what I actually did off screen. Um, another thing to be aware, so aware of is um, you could just do this through the normal uh, VMs, like the way that I showed you to run neural style. You could do this the exact same thing. You could open up a VM, you could run the Jupyter notebook tunnel through it, and then just run the commands there, and then you don't have to fiddle with like the whole storage directory stuff. So that might be a little bit easier, but then you have to deal with like, um, you know, turning the machine on and off. I mean, that's not a big deal. Like if you're just managing one machine. Uh, but it's nice to, like, the job runner is very scalable because then you could, like, for example, make a whole workflow that works in your computer and then submit jobs to it. We use the online job builder, but they have a, an API, like a command line uh, thing that you could, you could basically have everything locally, like the repository that you're working on, all your code and everything is there. And then you use the command line, uh, the CLI, to upload your repository to Paperspace. It runs the job and then sends the results back to you. So it's actually really convenient. It's like it's almost like having a GPU like sort of on command, like tethered to your computer through the cloud. So so doing it that way is actually kind of worth the overhead because because once you have that workflow done, it's it's super easy uh, to to it, it's super convenient. And Paperspace does have like uh, tutorials. I'm gonna stop that. Um, it does have tutorials on how to use it. Um, 
I forget. You, you can search. It's somewhere. You can find they have a whole tutorial on how to use the command line uh, the thing. You could download the API. Sorry, download the, the, um, the command line utility and so on. Now, um, just a couple really quick things. So we just did car, uh, we just did DCGAN TensorFlow. The BGAN TensorFlow is made by the same guy, and it basically has uh, almost the exact same interface. So you could potentially try to use this if you want. I haven't really used it, so I don't. I can't profess uh, as to how good it is. Now, progressive GANs is the one that makes super high resolution. So the upside is that it makes super high resolution images. The downside is that it requires an extraordinary amount of computation and time. So it's not for the faint of heart. Like if you do have access to a lot of GPUs, um, it, like like maybe like let's say through HPC, like if you know your way around it, I would definitely recommend that you could check it out. Like if you because okay, so like for a ten thousand image data set, it would take like one month to train on one GPU. That's no like joke. A, like, a like a 1080 Ti, like, like two to three weeks or something to train on one GPU. If you use eight GPUs, you can train in two days. So that's what I did for the WikiArt scan. So that's that's available to you. Uh, but you do have to set up an environment for this, and this it's mostly easy enough to use. It's also a command line utility. You, you there's like a config. Uh, configuration file. If anyone ends up using this, like come to me and I'll, I'll, I'll guide you through it. It's not actually that hard to use. Um, the, the hard thing is getting all the compute. Like that's the harder thing. I haven't used Glow, but it looks really cool like because because it's invertible and so like you can project your own face into the latent space and then you could like make yourself look older, make yourself look, you know, those are all cool things that you may want to, to experiment with. I haven't used it though, so I can't, I don't know how easy or, or hard it is to use. Oh, uh, oh, and one other thing, I have a script inside of the notebooks in the ML for a guides called DCGAN, that I, the IPython notebook, which can load an already trained model and then make interpolations. So this is something that someone did in my workshop where they, where they trained it. Oh, I thought I had a longer, wait, sorry. I thought. Can you two, two, any, any two images are no, no, you can just make interpolations between any latent codes that you want, including real ones, if you want. So you, it like, has problem string coding a given image. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so um, so this is this is trained on logos. But in any case, like, you can use this if you're interested in working with the trained model later. Um, and there's there's some minor de de details that I do need to kind of, like, uh, show you if you end up using it, because otherwise it might be a little... Like, because because the DCGAN TensorFlow by itself doesn't do most of the stuff that you'd want to use it for, so like um, it's it's very minimalistic. Um, and uh, so yeah, so that that's all for DCGAN TensorFlow. Um, okay, now next week we're going to get into conditional generative models, which means picks to picks basically, and some other categories. So we're going to be able to figure out how to turn horses into zebras and things like that. Uh, we'll be using mostly the same pipeline, right? We're going to be using data set utils. We're, we're going to be using paper space. So it would be really, really great idea to, to try to like run through this once. And like, again, like if I, if you're having any problems, like before you spend hours debugging, like, like email me and I, I can definitely show you. And, and I will have the recording up in, um, in like later tonight or tomorrow morning or something like that. So you saw the process from, from the beginning, uh, besides for inputting your credit card and everything. Um, so I'd love, I would love to see everyone train a DC GAN, yeah, like make a, make a DC GAN, generate some samples and, um, and just have some fun with it. Uh, once you can run the basic DC GAN, then everything else opens up to you, right? Because everything else is variations of the same flavor. It's like command line utility, point it to a folder of your own images, click start, wait a little while, come back and poof, you have some fairy dust that you could turn into zebras. So that's all. Um, I will uh, see you guys next week. Oh, one other, oh, office hours tomorrow, like uh, 12 to 7, let's say. Uh, email me. I'll try to set up a Calendly app at some point, but just like, please email me. Okay. All right. See you guys next week. Yep.